All right, we're here for the final of this series of oral history interviews with Regis McKenna. And today we're going to depart from the themes we've been talking about and cover another uh, really important area of your life and career, Regis, which is your work in politics and in particular democratic politics, um, at both at the state and the national level. Um, your work in higher education and your archive. Uh, those are three pretty meaty subjects. Okay. Uh, let me begin, if I can, with uh, a, a quote that may set the stage for this a little bit as people are watching and reading because uh, my guess is that uh, those who are, who are using these oral histories for um, various purposes may know quite a bit about you and your background in marketing, but they may not know as much about how you brought the way that you think about the world into the whole political sphere. So I'm going to begin by reading a quote from your 1999 essay called Governance, Technology, and Civil Society. You said, the digital revolution is giving rise to the age of the unsatisfiable customer. In this world, there are no citizens, only consumers and individuals are treated as such in more and more aspects of their lives. Political platforms, policies, social interactions are all marketed as the consumer model becomes universal. All these changes are most clearly evident in the U.S. where the digital economy was born and remains most highly developed. Political responses to consumer demand are faster and less consistent. Social trends display the same tendency. That's a that I thought that quote was just a wonderful distillation of everything we've been talking about, but brought to the right. political sphere. Yeah, uh, the term uh, uh, that you know we no longer are uh, citizens; we're all consumers. Came from Peter Coyote, the uh, actor, you know, narrator. I mean, people recognize his voice more than they do his face. Um, lives in San Francisco uh, and been there, I think, his whole life. Um, and uh, we were at some sort of an event, and I was sitting next to him, and and I was talking about the the, the need to, you know, uh, get more and more citizens actively involved in the political spectrum. And uh, he said, "But there are no more citizens." <laughs> he said, "There are only consumers," and that phrase really hit me, and and thought. That's right, because people start referring to uh, political candidates, particularly those of, say, president, as a brand. And so the brand becomes something you market. It's, it's, uh, it's often cosmetic. It's, it doesn't really, it's shallow. It doesn't have a lot of depth to it in many instances. Um, and, uh, and people try to shape the brand of the individual. Um, a little story with, uh, you know, we always, Think about Al Gore as being sort of stiff and in front of a camera, he wasn't very good and, and so forth. And um, I was watching um, uh, a, a television interview of him in which he was talking uh, on a football field about, I think he went to the University of, uh, is it Tennessee? Yes. He, yeah, and then he, they were, I think they were playing Florida and they were talking about that game and, and he was, he had a football and he was talking and he was very conversational and it was just, you know, right directly to the interviewer and the, and the TV audience. And so when I saw him later, I said, you know, Al, you should be do, acting like that in front of the camera and in front of everybody. Because, you know, uh, that's you, that's natural. It seems as though you put on something whenever you're trying to, and he said, I'm trying, I'm trying. Because he had all these advisors who were telling him how he should be. It's, it's you know, be presidential, we hear that phrase today. And, um, but they try to shape something that isn't there and, uh, and, and don't allow the natural person and their natural inclinations and, and thoughts and ideas and, and intellect to expose itself because it might, they might stumble, they might fall, and so they're so, and they're so afraid of failing that they, they do. And so, um, I think that uh, I have to thank Peter Coyote for sort of the uh, impetus to write that paragraph. Let's go back to um, the very beginning and, and how you developed your 
interest in, in civ civic and political issues, not just as someone who was interested in it, but someone who really wanted to roll up his sleeves and, and get involved in it. Yeah, um, I, I was very active in sort of uh, school government. And, uh, and I, in fact, I really wanted to go into politics. I think my, my first major was uh, political science. I kept changing majors. Um, and, um, and, and in fact, in my freshman year in college, uh, John Kennedy was a junior senator from Massachusetts came and talked to our, uh, uh, our, our school. And, uh, and, he, and his talk was about uh, the value of, of being a member of uh, the political uh, and organization and society, and that more people should consider going into government because it's a great profession and it serves your country. And uh, it really inspired everybody. I think the whole school became political science majors the next day, but, um, uh, it was an inspiring talk. I kept that talk, by the way. Uh, it was on the, on the college newspaper, and it's all yellowed and torn. And, and um, I just gave it to the president of uh, St. Vincent's College, where he, that's where he was talking. Um, and uh, but it inspired a lot of people to to get involved. Well, if you you know if you have a job in our society, you can still be a, a citizen. You can still be a very active citizen. And uh, and my wife had that same inclinations. So when we moved here to California, um, there was a, um, actually there was a priest activist, his name was Father Boyle. And, um, and one of the first propositions that, was, that we worked on back when we were in our mid 20s um, was uh, open, open housing um, because there was a lot of discrimination going on. And so that was a, uh, a highly contested proposition and um, there was a strong social movement for it. So, you know, we walked door to door, we walked precincts, uh, and, and were pretty active in that campaign and uh, was successful. And, um, and, uh, and my wife got, uh, obviously, she went into politics, and it was largely because there were, um, she joined an organization in Sunnyvale called Orchards, and the orchards were vanishing. And, um, and the developers, um, you know, were in the pockets of the politicians who set the, the, the codes on the, on the land use and so forth. So open space was, was vanishing. And, and um, she went to a meeting and spoke up. And she came home and she said, I think I put my foot in my mouth. They, they elected me chairman. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and then she went on to uh, become a uh, you know, city council member and mayor of, our, of Sunnyville. Uh, twice, and then uh, she went for county supervisor, Santa Clara County, which is Silicon Valley, and um, and then on to become a commissioner of California transportation systems. So she had had a long career of politics, which we heard about every night at the dinner table, and um, that kept us actively engaged. I think more than anything else. But uh, the other key factor was uh, was the um, the Semiconductor Industry Association that was formed by a handful of semiconductor executives. Uh, uh, Charlie Spork, uh, Bob Noyce, uh, Jerry Sanders, um, LJ7, of, um, and, and, and a number of those. And, and they were the ones that sort of were, um, uh, they were really naive um, players in the political spectrum. Um, what was the hard. purpose, the stated purpose of SIA? The stated everything? purpose was to try to, the, the, the semiconductor industry, as has happened to previous electronic, particularly electronic consumers, had vanished from American shores. Um, the cheaper, lower cost goods came in from Asia, uh, particularly, and, uh, and Japan, Japan Inc. was the dominant force at that time. And, um, this, the semiconductor RAM business had just was vanishing um, because, first of all, they were producing higher quality, but they also were, the, the way the, the, the financing was done in Japan, they had a lower cost of capital. So they could basically essentially finance their exports uh, through, through government subsidies. And um, that made a disadvantage to U.S. companies. So they were fighting for uh, a number of things. One was a level playing field. That became a very common theme. 
Um, another one was um, we have got to, um, and I think this is often not talked about, but one of the things that those people really stressed was um, trying to uh, reinstill um, technical education <clears throat> into the classroom. Um, that they felt that uh, you know there was a boom at the Sportnik area era, and then it collapsed, and there was uh, uh, less and less of uh, you know solid study in, in the STEM areas in 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 the schools, high schools, and so forth. So they they that was one of their one of their pillars of of trying to get more and more interest to, uh, from governments. Um, and that started for me. Um, I, I was I was a member. I started working with them because Charlie Spork. I worked for him, and of course I was a, a client of uh, Bob Noyce Hardis at Intel, uh, and so they sort of enlisted me to help them, and um, I did. And I worked with them pretty closely through the first I don't know how many years, but five or ten years. When did that all begin? Uh, it began in the early '80s. Uh, late 70s, or early 80s is when it when it was hitting, and um, the people used to say to Intel it was they were dominant in, in RAM memory. Is uh, not, uh, not why are you in it, but why why should you be in it? You know because uh, they weren't making any money. Um, they were trying to compete on a price basis, and uh, they were undercut always in the marketplace, and. Um, you know, we talk about the cohesiveness of American industry, but quite frankly, the the people who are using semiconductors um, and the people who make them are two different breeds of people. And um, the, the people who use them really don't care where those parts come from, as long as it's the right price and the right performance. And uh, and that's, I'm, I'm sure that's how it should be. Um, but um, th there, there was a hard road to get up and fight that. Um, from many, many, not only the economic reasons, but also to recapture the market. Now, let me ask you about something you said a minute ago about um, <clears throat> the founders of the of SIA being naive about how to go about this. So when you talk about names like Spork and Noyce and Sanders, these are not men who, by nature, are are naive about a lot of things. Why? What made you use that word about them in this political context? Because um, we did a, uh, we used to do these media tours, and, and I did a, a, a Washington tour. <clears throat> I knew a lot of the, the new Democrats in Washington. And so I took um, Spork and uh, uh, Noyce and Sanders, I think that's the three, and we went to uh, uh, Washington, D.C. and. Uh, and we met with congressmen after congressmen, both sides of the aisle, and told the story of what they, how they saw, you know, being limited access to the Japanese market, yet they had unlimited access to our market. Um, the cost of capital was a big issue. Education was an issue, these kinds of things. And, um, and the feedback was, well, we haven't seen any money from you people, uh, so why should we vote for, you know, benefits to benefit your industry and that shocked them they were absolutely blown away by that they thought why do we have to give money to people to do their job you know they're supposed to be representing America and they really felt that the semiconductor industry was an essential technology to the to the future of America and uh, and, it, and it is and was and uh, uh, and, and yet and yet they were shocked by that I mean they just couldn't believe it. that's all they talked about afterwards was you know these people you know, sort of holding their hand out, and um, and it fun was that it was that direct. It was that yeah, it was absolutely that direct. Gloves off. We Gloves you haven't off. give us any money. Right. Why should we be listening? Exactly. Uh, and uh, I mean, I can see the the congressman sitting across the table and saying that, you know, we haven't seen a penny of your of your money, and so uh, and I think that's continued. I think Silicon Valley has looked at it as a wealthy area and therefore should be giving more money to the political. And it has been, um, I think, in recent years, but it wasn't always that way. Um, it, it was very, very hard to get money out of Silicon Valley. Um, and um, uh, it, at least if, if you were a Democrat, uh, I think there were, uh, and it wasn't that Silicon Valley was, uh, was Republican. It's really fairly well split, and it has always been. So the 
the Santa Clara County, if you go back and look at the voting records, um, they're pretty even, um, and, but they're more liberal than they are conservative. So they'll, they'll tend to be economically conservative and socially liberal. Um, but, um, but they sort of, you know, I mean, we've elected you know, Republican governors and we've elected Democratic governors. Uh, most of the local people are, are more Democrats probably than Republicans, but it's the people who lived in the valley who were the voters, the people who were running the companies lived up in the hills. And so there's, there's a differentiation of, of wealth that determined the, the bias. So in, in other words, at that time, top executives like Noyce and the rest were just not politically active. They just weren't here in, in their local areas. They weren't getting to know Congress people or senators or no. any of that. No, I mean, um, I, can, I can remember when I was at National and I went there in 1967, when it first started up here in the valley, um, uh, a lot of the local uh, uh, political people in, at city government in Santa Clara uh, wanted to meet the president, uh, and they they were going to be passing, you know, um, zoning laws and other kinds of things, and uh, um, they didn't want to meet with them. They thought it was a waste of time, and uh, let that off to somebody else in the organization to do, and uh, it's it sort of offended I think a lot of the, the political people. Um, but I think the, the, and I think that, uh, again, the executives in the industry felt they had to get to a certain higher level to make things happen. It wasn't going to happen at local so much as it was going to happen at state and, and national. Even state doesn't have a lot to do with trade. Uh, I mean, it does today perhaps, but then it was, it was sort of a, an overseer, but not a, an active player in, uh, in international trade issues. Um, um, you know, intellectual property rights was still an issue. Um, so there were growing issues in the industry uh, that were, were critical. And um, uh, I had, uh, as, we get, as, it, as it got more active, um, I had a, um, I, think, I think my company was the only company that was a member of SIA that was not a manufacturer for, the, for at least the short, you know, for the first five or six years. Um, and uh, I got a call from somebody from Jerry Brown's office when he was in his first term. And he came down and, and met with me. He was one of his aides, <clears throat> uh, political aides. And we just had a long conversation about what was going on. And then um, Brown invited me up to Sacramento to spend an afternoon with him. And I did. And we went up, literally kicked the shoes off, sat around, and just talked for you know hours in the afternoon about what was going on in Silicon Valley. And... Um, uh, largely about the, the trade issue. And um, as a result of that, we then uh, uh, decided to have a, a meeting. And so uh, I had a dinner at my home in which we invited key executives from Silicon Valley, um, and uh, including uh, Jobs and Noyce and, and people of that, that nature. We have a picture of that we're going to put into the... Yeah. Uh, into the oral history of everyone sitting around your kitchen, your dining room table. Just that was a small area. Looks very, very casual, very it informal. Was. Uh, and Jerry handled himself really well. He's a very smart guy. And, and they, they were quite impressed. They just didn't know what he could do. Um, he then formed the California Commission on Industrial Innovation. And, um, and I was the, the president of it. And he, um, he, really, he really was the one that ran it. And it, it was where they, you know, tried to get people together. In fact, um, Dave Packard was part of that, um, and, and other executives, even some from the biotech area and others, to try to decide, you know, what is it that we can do? How can we, you know, lobby Washington uh, from a little bit more position of power? And how can we work? And, and I remember, um, uh, you know, Brown saying, you know, your, your strength is in numbers. So the more people you can get into organizations, the more you can get Packard is the more you can get heard, you will be heard. Um, Let's go back just for a minute before you move on. I, I want to talk about your, your initial meeting with Jerry Brown, your, your first impressions of him. This would have been the early mid-70s mid probably, right? Yeah. Uh, if he was in his first term. Uh, to talk a little bit about, about Brown as a young man, as a young governor, as a young politician, and your impressions. Well, uh, he was... Uh, he, he, you know, he, he had a hard time sitting still, I think. He was, 
He was highly animated. Um, he was very bright, uh, and um, he could he could handle things very well. And largely, it was him asking questions, a lot of questions about things and probing. Um, he had a fascination for technology. Um, they, you know, when they called him Moonbeam, that was because he wanted to put up a satellite system for California um, for industry to start connecting through satellites. And that, they then started nicknaming him Moonbeam, but in fact, they have him today. Um, so it was actually a good idea that uh, people sort of uh, labeled him as a pejorative term. Um, I think that he was, he was young and he was like a bull in a china shop. He was running into a lot, young bull, uh, running into a lot of issues and problems. So, um, but I, I thought he was a good leader and uh, an effective leader. And uh, he always had a lot of ideas. So that, that when we had uh, that dinner that night, um, I remember Sandy Kurtzig was there, Noyce was there, Jobs was there. Um, there were some people from, uh, as I said, the, the uh, several other people from this SIA. Um, and there were some people from biotech, I remember. Um, and uh, he, he held his own. I was going to ask you, could he hold his own? Oh, absolutely. Company, yeah. He had no problem holding his own. And he was, in age terms, uh, really a contemporary of the rest of them, maybe even younger than, yeah. Uh, yeah. than some of the people around the yeah. table. And he didn't, he didn't hesitate. He didn't uh, appear to pause on anything or, or feel as though he didn't know the answers to anything. Were you happy with the way that evening went? It went very well, I yeah. think, yes. And um, was he happy with it? Did you get feedback from him about... Well, we, we stayed sort of long-term friends after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, and, and uh, continued to talk from time to time. He called me, um, you know, and we would have conversations. And, and then we met with, with, through this, uh, the California uh, Commission, and, and we met frequently. Um, and that included larger and larger groups of people. Um, sort of his, his advice that their strength in numbers. Right. That, was, that must have been true both for that commission and for the SIA itself. Yes, and, and of course, as the semiconductor industry grew, so did it, and it took on different ideas. Um, and it, 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 the whole idea of trying to do something, they were looking, they were looking for uh, more government finance, and, and just as uh, even out of the DOD. Um, but there were funds available in government for projects that can't be done by any one company alone. And, and the whole idea of, of the the uh, research center down in, in Austin was to work on, um, originally it was to work on um, creating more flexible manufacturing in semiconductors. And so um, they spent quite a, got a lot of people down there, smart people and, and got funded. And uh, that was a continuing sort of um, lifelong journey for Bob because Bob moved to Austin with Ann Byers. Bob Noyce. Yeah, and, um, uh, and, and took charge of it, even though he didn't particularly want to do that. But nobody else would do it. And he felt, he literally felt it was his obligation as, uh, as a citizen to do that because he felt that the semiconductor industry was vital to American interests. And that's the way he would put it. Why did Symantec end up in Austin? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, except that uh, um, it, it probably was a neutral territory, um, and that was required because so many uh, semiconductor companies were from all over the United States, um, although TI was there. Um, but IBM was a member of SIA. Uh, so more and more of the, the uh, companies who manufactured their own semiconductors, even though they were large, systems companies joined it as well. So it became a, a, a powerful force. Were you involved with Bob Noyce as he was thinking this whole thing through and trying to make the decision to, to take that role and leave Intel? Uh, I, I, no, no, I think that, but I knew about it. I knew that he was trying, contemplating it. Uh, and I knew uh, um, that the decision they made was a, was a difficult decision because you know, he had a, basically had spent most of his career here in the valley, um, and um, you know to pull up and, and move 
was uh, a significant factor. Well, and I've heard others say that he, he took it on with a little bit of a fatalistic attitude because it seemed like such a difficult thing to pull off. An industry consortium is one of the very hardest things yeah. to, to build into a yeah, success. Yeah, and keep everybody happy. And there were, uh, there were a few semiconductor uh, company leaders who disagreed with the whole approach. You know, they didn't want anything to do with government. And um, that frustrated Bob a great deal. That I know, because um, I went down to spend some time with him on strategy about three weeks before he died down there. And uh, that was the topic of conversation, was uh, um, you know, what they're hitting in Washington is even your own people don't, don't buy into this. Um, and there were a few outstanding examples of that, which was sort of ludicrous because the industry started with, uh, with government support. It, it, it would not have survived here in, in its infancy if it hadn't been for government support. They were the only major customers, and they were doing, funding a lot of research and development. And yet these companies at that point didn't have anything remotely resembling a government relations office or a person who was thinking they, about Well, they, they had sales forces because <laughs> we you know, sold to DOD. When I was at uh, General Microelectronics in 1965, um, I ran a, a, a technical writing group and we did proposals um, on the, techno the semiconductor technology we were developing to all of the, aeros you know, the major aerospace uh, agencies. Um, you know, DOD or uh, I remember Wright Pat, Air Force Base, those kind of things. And um, um, I even had to have secret clearance you know, because the stuff was considered highly proprietary. It was the really early days at GME, it was the early days of MOS technology. Did you, thinking about your, your, your observation going to Washington with these semiconductor CEOs and the reaction you get, was that a kind of light bulb moment for you as well as for them? Did, did everyone begin to understand hey, if we're going to be effective at the policy level in Washington and tap into these, these government initiatives as well, we're going to have to have a real organized political activity here? I think that came, that evolved out of that, definitely. Uh, that they would have to start uh, putting together uh, resources to uh, start getting even some lobbyists and um, and that, that really evolved out of those meetings. I think the, the, other, the thing that, one of the things that was so shocking is just what the industry was up against because after the Washington visit, we went up to New York City and we went to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and, and a few of the major publications to, to talk about what we had been talking about down there in Washington. And the, the media, the headlines were, semiconductor industry goes to Washington for handout. And that wasn't at all what they were there for, but that was what industries did. And so they were thrown in with a batch of everybody else. They really had much more, um, they were trying to be good citizens and they saw them as um, promoters in order to get money funded in the industry. And um, it, it was just such a, and it's what they had, the, the media had been used to seeing so they just assumed that that's what the semiconductor industry was at. But the industry so, had finally grown up enough that it could go to Washington and ask, ask for, for a money. handout. Huh. Um, which, is the, which is the complete opposite of what these people were politically conservative people. What, uh, who, when you think about the, the politicians at, at the state and national level in that period, say during the 80s when you were really beginning to ramp up your own involvement and, and your involvement on behalf of these companies. Who stands out for you as people who were um, the most capable, maybe the most effective, the ones who really understood the issues and, and worked hard to, to make a difference on them? On, on the uh, elected official side? Yes. Um, well, uh, there was um, certainly, I think, um, as we moved further out was uh, Bill Clinton. He liked Silicon Valley, he spent a lot of time here. 
I think he understood the issues. How did you first meet him? Um, I'm not sure who arranged it, but um, when he was governor. Uh, uh, so he would have been a candidate, perhaps, or maybe before not his a, He wasn't even a candidate. It was when he was, con he was contemplating. Um, there was a meeting arranged between uh, my wife and I and him at the Fairmont in San Francisco. And we met him in a, in a, in a suite. We just sat and talked for a couple hours um, and um, about his intentions and how he saw this area and so forth. What were your impressions? Um, my wife asked very pointed questions about his background <laughs> um, and things like that. Um, but I found him to be very, again, he was knowledgeable about what was going on. He read a lot um, and he, he was familiar with the players. And, um, and he understood the issues. And several issues later on, um, he proved it uh, when he, uh, uh, what was the proposition? Uh, oh, the proposition, there was a proposition that was put on California ballot that essentially um, enabled the trial lawyers so, uh, to um, present more and more frivolous lawsuits. And that was plaguing the industry because um, they would be sued for anything that they said, or you put out a brochure on a product and you use an adjective and they would pull that out and use it against you as you're promoting a product and, and inflating the stock. Um, I was sued by them. I mean, everybody was a close to it was sued. Um, and um, uh, it was a, a fellow by the name of Larac. And um, he was one of the chief lawyers there that really was the most uh, onerous of, of all of them. And um, uh, they, some people say that they wrote the proposition so that they could continue. And they were making hundreds of millions of dollars a year just by settling because none of the industry felt they were just wasting money going against these people. So just pay them, you know, pay them the whatever they wanted or, or negotiate a payment. And so they were collecting sort of free passes uh, and a lot of money. And um, so that proposition, uh, 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 most of Clinton's staff told him to stay out of it. And, um, and I, I, I did write him a letter. Um, I had a friend in the White House that actually gave it to him, so I know he got it. And it really spelled out the issue. And uh, he came out here. He met with uh, me and Gordon Moore and, and John Doerr and several other people uh, in San Jose. And he told us he was gonna support us in that, on that issue. And it was not a popular issue. Um, and, um, and, and he, he saw the, the, the real danger in, in that sort of thing. So it, it would have driven a lot of companies out of California. Um, and, you know, so I think he was, he was, he, he really had a, a large influence down on the, on, on the industry. And he, he must have made 20 or 30 visits here. I mean, he came here a lot. He, uh, we had a meeting with a, a group of industry people and venture capitalists at my home again um, with him when he was president and uh, that was a big event and uh, they didn't pick my home because I was uh, a political ally he picked it because my home was the closest to Moffett Field where he would fly in and could get to some place quickly um, and uh, but John Doerr was very active in, in that as well um, as I said Gordon Moore attended these meetings and, and others so Gordon was quiet but effective and uh, and, uh, and forceful and had a very profound insight into things. And so he, you know, he didn't put on many fancy kinds of conversations. He just could say something that would penetrate the, the surface and, and make people aware of what the issue was. And what sort of following did he develop here in Silicon Valley as the result of all of that? Oh, he had a, a huge following. Um, I mean, you know, I think it was sort of the turning point in terms of more of the young industry leaders um, going more liberal and more democratic um, uh, because I think today it's, well, California is, is a blue state and, um, it, and um, I think that's what, uh, um, what the, the result of it was. Why was he so 
switched on when it came to technology issues? Well, it was a cool subject. I mean, you know, it was, uh, there was lots of fascinating and mind-blowing kinds of technology going on. I mean, when you start thinking about putting, uh, you know, 25,000 transistors on a little piece of silicon size of a thumbnail, uh, even th that's nothing today. But at that time, you know, uh, that was enormous technology. And so just to take them through the, the process, take them through a, a, a tour of a, la uh, of a, a foundry was, uh, was mind-blowing. I mean, and then when you went into the biotech labs and you saw similar you know, the potentials for all, there were all kinds of companies around that were addressing, uh, you know, diseases and gen genetic, genetic engineering and things of that nature. Um, it, it, it became a fascinating place to visit. And people continue to come here from all over the world to, to see what's going on here. Because this is, you know, where a lot of the origin of a lot of new technology exists. Have you stayed in touch with him over the years? Uh, I've seen him a couple times. Uh, I haven't kept in touch, but I've uh, I've seen him at some events, um, you know, where I've been and he's been. Right. Um, of course, the intellectual twin of uh, of Bill Clinton when it came to technology was Al Gore. Uh, they were joined at the hip for that right. entire period. Talk a little bit about Al Gore, your exposure to him, and and his work here. Yeah. Well. Um, of course, Al, uh, you know, became the, uh, on the board of Apple. Um, he was, uh, and he enjoyed that. He was more of a techie than anybody else, um, I think, in terms of pure gadgeteer. Um, and, uh, you know, he became a, a joined Kleiner Perkins uh, once he left um, and, and was continually active, and I think on other, other boards uh, in the technology area. So, um, Al was always a little bit aloof, but um, in, in terms of, um, I think, approaching broader public. But personally, um, you know, when I see him, he gives me a big hug. He, you know, we talk about old times. Uh, um, I, I just, I treated him like he was a human being and not vice president. And um, I think that's the way he, he wanted to be treated. So you call him Al, you don't call him Mr. Vice President and, and so forth. So. Um, and and they, I think they, he appreciated that more than anybody else. He didn't like the drapings of the office. Did he have his own independent set of contacts and friendships and relationships here in Silicon oh, certainly. Valley? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What was his area of interest or his areas of interest that, that you were exposed to? Well, I think, um, I think he was really fascinated by the personal computer because he was, he was a journalist. Uh, at a period of his time, and uh, I think the ability to use a personal computer and for creating, you know, writing the news, for sending that to different parts, from absorbing it, going online, that sort of area was, uh, um, you know, he was he was beat up for saying that he invented the internet, um, and but he was very instrumental in moving the internet through to commercialization in in Washington. Yeah, uh, very instru very instrumental in that, and um, and um, and and I think he, he he has to be credited for that. Yeah, because um, most people still thought it was a sort of a remote science, um, and there was this agency called we, I don't remember what the name is the acronym stood for, but it was Internec, uh, was the was this, the, the, and that was sort of the government agency that was formed or the independent agency that was formed to manage the internet. And um, that's where you would apply for your, uh, for your email address. Did you, in your, in your work uh, professionally, Regis, did, how much was political advice uh, and a, a, a component of the work that you did for the companies you represented? Um, very little, very little. Um, I, I think that, um, I, you know, um, I got beat up for it a couple times, um, um, was threatened by it, uh, uh, even through letters, um, um, particularly when I supported Cranston over uh, Ed Shaw, um, that um, people took out actually ads in news, local newspapers 
Is, and, and then that was your personal decision, right? Or, or was it? No, it was my personal decision. Sure, yeah. To, yeah. To, to support Cranston and Nunchuck, yeah. which was your right as a citizen. Yeah, but they took out ads saying I should be ashamed of myself and that, um, and I was told privately at lunch that I would lose business as a result of that. Um, and, um, you know, but that was, I didn't, that it bother me. Um, you know, as, as you say, it was my right to do that, and, um, and I did. So, um, and, um, you know, for me, I, uh, at the time, I think we we're well known, and I used it as a platform as well. So, um, I had no apologies there because I thought that, you know, our heart was in the right place. So you, was that, a, was that a conscious decision to separate political advice from, from your, your, your business consulting? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Because the, the, the political advice was, um, it, it was more individualistic. It, it, and and you, I think if you were representing an Intel or an Apple, you can't expect everybody to sort of follow the, the, the leader. They have the freedom and the right to do what they want to do in, in their direction. And so um, I don't think any of them really wanted that sort of thing. I think we, uh, the one thing that I would do is I would invite people to various events, and, they, and I did have lists of people, and mostly that I would know that were you know, more democratic, um, and I would um, send that list out whenever. Uh, for example, uh, um, Gary Hart was a good friend of mine, and, um, and um, I ran the, uh, I gave him, the, actually I think it was the first major fundraiser for a uh, presidential candidate here in the Valley of any size. How did you meet and get acquainted with Gary um, Hart? Just through my political channels in Washington, and was introduced. And then I sort of introduced him to the technology side of business. And, um, and uh, I spent actually a lot of time with him. Uh, he, again, was a very bright policy person, uh, great historian, understood the politics of the government well. Um, and uh, I even went to the Kentucky Derby with him. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we shut down the Lion and Compass on Sunday and I had a, a, a brunch for, we've packed the place with people to come and listen to him talk. And um, I think we raised, this was when he was running, which was quite a few years ago. I think we raised $25,000 and that was a big bucket. In that, 1988, that yeah, was a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and... Um, what did you think of him? Well, up until people found out about his, his hidden life, uh, I thought he was... Uh, He'd make a superb president, and he may have made one anyway, right? I mean, uh, as we know, uh, th th those things are, can be separated and have been separated in people's minds. He would have made a superb president, I think, just because he thought very seriously about Gary rights on government. He's, he, uh, he, he went back and got a, a Fulbright scholarship on understanding international governments. I mean, he, he was... Uh, he was a scholar as well as a, a, an able politician, good speaker, um, and uh, you know had one problem, <laughs> which turned out to be the, the problem. The problem that was called a Bimini problem. Right? It was, so, yeah. and that was a shock. I mean, even to his staff. I mean, I knew people very close to him who were just blown away by it, and it just it devastated them. And many of them left politics for the rest of their life. What, how often did you find yourself back in Washington working on various issues? Um, actually, I was part of a, a couple organizations back there, the New Democrat organizations uh, and so forth. So I was back there maybe once a month, um, if not more. So I was there frequently. Um, conferences, um, I gave testimony to Congress at least once on the SIA issue. Um, and so meeting with different people back there and knowing friends back there. Uh, Washington's a great place to visit. There's a lot to do there. Um, and so it's, it's never a disappointment to go there, even if you just see politicians and, and uh, visit uh, the various museums and so forth. 
I'd like to talk for a minute too uh, along those lines. You mentioned the, the New Democrats and, and that organization. Um, let, me, let me interject something. One of the things that I did a, a lot of, there was the, the Berkeley Roundtable on International Economy, which was out of Berkeley. It was the political science department. And they were sort of a, a quasi-political organization doing background research on trade issues and other things. And, and I, w I became a member of Bree. And, and um, through that, Bree and others, I was often on panels or giving talks. And, and my conversations were always about the, um, the social and economic implications of technology. It wasn't about you know, what a chip's all about. It wasn't preaching about Apple or anything else. It was largely showing that, uh, like the whole issue of real time with the technology getting faster, and it's having more impact on our society in terms of people not having time to actually absorb stuff, uh, absorb information. And so um, that's where it sort of led me to write a couple chapters on uh, information is disposable. So we don't keep anything in our minds anymore. It just constantly comes and goes and it becomes a consumable, just like, uh, you know, uh, food. And, uh, and, and that leads to all kinds of implications in our society and also political implications and what to expect out of that. Um, I gave a talk on, um, that, you know, on, on the internet in the early days of the internet about the fact that um, um, when you have everybody on the internet, you're gonna have um, positive and negative forces, excuse me, what I call matter and antimatter. So you can put up something that matters, but there's always gonna be someone that has antimatter. And antimatter kills matter. And, and excuse me again, um, and, and I had a slide on that that I would explain that, and that our society was going to be filled with this matter, antimatter conversation over the internet because you have, everybody has their own microphone. And it's going from access to broadcast. And uh, I gave that to a, a lot of the political staff, as well as several, you know, quite a few senators and congressmen, um, which I remember some prominent ones disagreed with me on it, said that'll never happen. And certainly. Because this was early on. You were giving these talks in the early 2000s. Right? Yeah. Because the internet was, we'd I, gone through internet 1.0 and and it was here to stay, although a lot of right. people felt it was going to die off, and it certainly wasn't as penetrated as right. it is today. So they felt that you you just were completely off base. Yeah, they didn't think so, that, that that would happen, that we would see this kind of... Uh, so I said that there would be more fragmentation. Um, and, and that comes from, quite frankly, looking again at the technology, that when you have um, um, programmable manufacturing, it's no longer one unit. I mean, the, the machine tool people change every so often to, to, to make a new configuration. So when you have the ability to constantly change the production line to something new all the time or update constantly, then you can start producing items at a lower cost for narrower segments of the market than was economically possible to do before. Because you can only make economies of scale when you ran a lot of the same thing. Well, now you can make a lot of different things in different ways. So uh, your cars are modular. Your, your entertainment systems at home are modular. Your refrigerator is modular. Everything we buy today has little modules in it that are customizable and can be plugged and played. And so you can assemble everything in the world today through these little customizable modules that can be adapted. And, um, and, and I, you know, that was just for me watching the technology evolve. And so I, I had written on that in several of my books as well. So, um, you know, talking on that and trying to prepare them for what they're going to see in the future. Um, uh, I don't think I was successful, but I think <laughs> um, some people listened. Yeah. Well, you, you were pretty far ahead of your time with a lot of those ideas. Um, you wrote, there, this is another quote from your, your 1999 essay. I mean, we're sitting here in January 2019, so 20 years ago, yeah. you were writing these words. Um, this, is the, this is another quote. The U.S. will be the first to feel and deal with the problematic aspects of the digital economy and society. 
social, political, and economic organizations will have to confront a world of shallower commitments and more volatile demands. The digital age has also begun to produce another byproduct, increase inequality. Each of these trends will require responses if the health of societies, polities, and the increasingly global digital economy is to be maintained. Yeah. And again, it's, it's because the, the, the digital technologies fragment. You know, we moved out of the mass marketing world of mass mentality, if you will, to every ethnic group wants to be heard. Uh, every segment of our society wants to be heard. And, um, and now can be heard. Yeah, there, there was another example of that that I saw very, very early here in the Valley, and I remember this was maybe 40 years ago or maybe even 50 years ago. The Wall Street Journal was, uh, the West Coast edition of the Wall Street Journal was published and printed up on Page Mill Road. And they would uh, adapt editions around the country because they could uh, use computers to do the typesetting and they could take excerpts uh, that fit this area and create a custom newspaper. And so the Vietnamese community in San Jose get a Vietnamese edition. The Hispanic community in this area get an Hispanic edition. And that's all programmable. So when you begin to essentially feed each of these segments like they were back in their own country, um, then they begin to feel comfortable here because they can speak their native language. They can use their cultural food. I mean, you can get any kind of food in the world you want right here within 10 miles of, this, of where we're sitting. And so it's become adapted to the diversity of our society. And that's due to the ability of technology to create this, this, this segmental support system and um, from newspapers to food. And um, I think that, that you could see coming with the customization of technology um, and the ability, why they set up the SIA down in, in uh, Austin was to create more flexibility in the manufacturing process. And when you think about the EEPROM, um, um, and in fact, I read Toffler's uh, uh, Future Shock many years ago, and he said, we will soon see the age um, when diversity costs no more than uniformity. And I wrote in the column, that's an EEPROM, you know, because it's, in, it's, it's programmable. So, but they make it like a semiconductor, so it could be made in a mass process, and you program it, and then you simply, you, at the time, you just passed an ultraviolet light over a little window, and it erased the program, and you did it again. And so that became sort of the, the I, I mean, if you looked at the technology, you could sort of extract a lot of the, the what you could see societies mimicking it later in, in, in very social forms. You also wrote in that quote I read a minute ago about increased inequality. What did you what, what did you mean by that? What what um, what trend were you spotting at that point that that caused you to read about increased inequality as a byproduct of this digital revolution? Well, because the digital revolution means that, um, quite frankly, you have to have a, a sort of an elite class of people who go to school and learn how to make algorithms, learn how to create these computer technologies, learn how to deal with the new world of physics. Um, and, and the education was just simply becoming more and more expensive. Um, and access to the tools, even online tools, which we, we always said you could learn through television, but it's very hard for people who, um, who are trying to move themselves up the, uh, the ladder of society to get access to those tools and to that education system. And um, my feeling at that time was that if you walk through Silicon Valley, you do see a lot of people who are just really well educated. Not necessarily all of them came out of wealthy families, but they somehow or other got access to education, which is a wealth for this society. If you're not, if you don't have an advanced degree in this society, you're not wealthy. And so it, it differentiated a lot of people. And, um, and, and I felt that that fragmentation um, was going to continue. Um, I want to go back now to 
to use something you said a minute ago as a, as a launching point for another set of questions about the relationship between Washington and Silicon Valley. You said a minute ago that you were giving these very far-sighted and, and very prescient uh, talks about the coming effect of technology on society um, and that some people in Washington didn't see it and, and disagreed that it was going to happen. Of course, now it, it has come to pass. But that leads me to think about my own observations about the distance in so many ways, not just geographically, but that's almost a metaphor for the distance between Washington and Silicon Valley, the way they, they work. They work differently. They think differently. They move at different paces. They have different lenses that they see the world. Um, did you experience that? And, and, and how, did you, how did you try to bridge it uh, you know, both yeah. through your work for clients and in these other organizations. Well, I think there of. was a there was a, a a ray of hope and light. I think in the '80s, uh, where we sort of felt that uh, the technology was, while it was a negative, um, it could be used as a positive uh, too, and and that the use of uh, let's say uh, computer networks and computer storage and so forth to um, to aggregate medical knowledge from multiple sources around the world and apply it to a specific uh, disease um, can and does work, um, and and those sorts of things. So the ability to, um, I, I, I think, if you look at the internet and, for, and when it started, it was sort of the idea. Of, it it was a tool to bring people closer together, not to to, to create the fractionalization that's occurred. Um, and um, you know, the, it, it, it appealed in many cases. It appeals to the lesser nature in man, uh, as well as to the higher nature. So this is the two extremes, and and it's it's um, it, it's something that technology has known. We have uh, uh, nuclear technology for that can be used for good or it can be used for bad, and um, you know, and I think that's all technologies, and we haven't. We haven't learned how to live in this. That was always the end of mine. We haven't learned how to live in this society, and we have to learn. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work and a lot of study and a lot of un, uh, you know understanding. And um, I think that um, I just read an article the other day. Why is Congress so dumb? And um, and you wonder. I mean, it's it's here we are in an advanced, really scientific age, and our Congress is dumb. You know and and. Uh, just when they interviewed the, the various people and, uh, on social media, they didn't know what questions to ask. They didn't know even the basics of the industry. Now, the article says that it's because they've cut funding on all their staff, so they have nobody to do research work for them anymore, or present them with a, you know, a, a, a briefing paper on before they go into these hearings. And um, so the, the funding cuts, the, the, the nature of, uh, of creating a fragmented society, uh, what is gerrymandering but fragmentation? Fragment our society to a point where you know nobody uh, of significant can uh, can influence Washington. And so um, I I, th I think it's a it's a bleak time for our society, but it's a it's a boom time for technology. And uh, those two I think aren't really in sync. And I I do believe that it's. Uh, that it's a matter of society learning how to, you know, engage that technology in a fruitful and positive way, um, because we've we've seen over the uh, over the twentieth century, you know, perhaps one of the more violent centuries, uh, you know, of the last five centuries, um, where um, we were supposed to be in the age of the industrial age of of of, uh, of growth and body. I mean, uh, you know, Germany prior to World War One was a democracy. It was, uh, and yet it was on the leading edge of of, te of industrial technologies. Um, and uh, and and same with you know, Japan was on the rise, and these fell apart. And um, uh, for political reasons, not necessarily because of technology reasons, or maybe it was a mixture of both. But um, there's a lot of need for today for more um, social philosophy, if you will, of 
how, how to operate in a society that is conflicted with itself. And um, that's why, uh, why I helped initiate this study for science, science, technology, and society, is to try to get young students to sort of look at this in a serious way and start sort of trying to figure out how can technology be used in a positive fashion in our society and how can we absorb more people into the fold so that they're not sort of uh, looking at it as a, as a hindrance to their progress or growth. What in your experience did, has worked in getting Congress, members of Congress in particular, uh, clued into this? It, <laughs> Money. That's, it's just that. It's, uh, um, I mean, is there a way to impart some in addition to a check, <laughs> along with that check, is there a way to impart some there are, there, Yeah, there are, there are certainly some people who are much more uh, altruistic. I think, um, I, I think much of our Congress people here in the Bay Area and in, in Northern in California have been very good, and, and they, are, they are probably uh, sharper on technology than most of the people in Washington, just because they know uh, they visit the companies, they know the people who are running the companies, they, they reach out to them and they get tours and they get, you know, all the necessary educational kind of materials from them and so forth. And, and when they need something, they go to those people and, and they ask them. And so that's our elected representatives from California. Um, I don't think that's true in a lot of other places. I think they tend to listen to the lobbyists from various industries but not necessarily directly from the industry leaders. And I think we've sort of taken a, a place where many of our industry, it's why people are shocked by, uh, let's say, Facebook Zuckerberg not going directly and speaking in Congress because so many of our leaders have done it individually as leaders of companies. They've met with them personally. Um, and, uh, you know, Eric Schmidt has, has been very active in politics and willing to educate anybody who, um, you know, who wants from Washington on what's going on in, in our digital society. Uh, and he's very good at it. Um, and so um, I, I think there are some that's doing that, but not certainly near enough. So uh, when I say the money, you know, um, money speaks. It still does. And, I, and, and my sort of... Uh, little story on that is that in Fiddler on the Roof, Tevye, the main character, sings the song, If I Were a Rich Man. And I'm paraphrasing, but he says, if I were a rich man, I'd sit in the temple and I'd lecture to the wise men all day long. And it wouldn't matter if, if, if I'm right or wrong. When you're rich, they think you know. And so I'm always amazed that people who become spokesmen and, the, and, and Washington listens to or whatever, ed, ed, you know, experts on everything from education to taxes or uh, political spectrum um, because they are wealthy. And they do have the voice that's loudest and clearest in Washington. Yeah. Any thoughts on the current group of uh, uh, leaders? We have a, you know, a new governor in Gavin Newsom. We have uh, the Speaker of the House is a native Californian. We've got uh, a whole new crop of Democrats, a lot of which you, you know and have become acquainted with during their candidacy over the last few years. What are your assessments and, and hopes about what's going to happen? Well, um, there is uh, uh, certainly, I think, I've known Nancy Pelosi for a long, long time. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, and some of her, uh, you know, loyal people back there have been supporting her for years. Uh, like Zoe Lofgren and Anna Eshoo, those are two of our congresswomen here in the area. Um, they are also very, very well engaged with the technology companies here, and they know most of the leaders, and they meet with them, and, and um, they ask them for help. Um, and um, I know that I still get asked for help on them. I, I see them frequently, uh, or you know, more, maybe not as much as I used to, but I certainly do see them. I know that um, when uh, NAFTA was up for uh, um, uh, you know vote, that I that um, Anna Eshoo called me and asked me to have dinner, and we talked for a whole evening about NAFTA, 
And, um, um, and so she does reach out and try to find out from other people what she should be doing. So they're not just sitting there making um, you know, independent decisions on their own. Uh, I think they do, they're, they're pretty good. And uh, I think they operate in sort of the Silicon Valley manner of reaching out to your constituents and engaging and learning. Um, and I think that uh, it's still a little too early to say there's so many uh, counter, or so much antimatter because you have, um, you know, they're one body of government. And I think they will be a strong body of government that will create uh, um, opposition to the uh, executive branch um, and perhaps even an overriding capability when certain issues come up um, because it's close in the, in the Senate as well. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a wide margin of, of dominance by the Republicans. Um, but there seems to be a, a sort of an anti-government, anti, -government, anti um, intellectual, anti-science. That's I think the, the thing that bothers me more about the governments we've seen in the last um, um, you know couple elections uh, at a national level has been the growing tendency to sort of anti-intellectual and anti-science and anti-technology. Um, you know, there th that's um, um, I think that's just harmful to the country um, because. Uh, Certainly, to survive in the future, we, we see the growth of technology. In, in, I've seen it in 55 years, and I can say, I, you know, my first one was a single transistor, and now, you know, having you know, a watch with um, what five billion transistors in it. I mean, that that's just going to explode in the next 20 years, uh, and and because there's so many different people working on it. I mean, just China putting a rocket on the dark side of the moon. Um, we're finding more and more out about uh, everything, everything we're finding more about. And uh, there's obviously more knowledge um, that is being absorbed and available to us today than has happened since the, the beginning of mankind. And we see that in shorter, shorter as a period of time. It's, you know, it's uh, Buckminster Fuller's knowledge doubling curve. It's now down t to hours where it used to be years and it used to be generations. Now it's down to hours. And so um, I, I really feel it's essential that we get a Congress that's knowledgeable about the new sciences and the new technologies and the ability to fund education in a way that uh, maintains uh, a, a standard of living for you know all of our people, so that they, the, the Americans who so that they can achieve some part of that future science world because um, it's going to be a very hard world to live in unless you're, you're educated and, and, uh, and capable. Um, that's, that's, that's my feeling. And uh, I'm not sure we've seen much help in that area uh, in the last uh, 20 years. This is a good, uh, a good point, given everything that you've just said, to segue into the second topic for this morning okay. session, which is uh, Santa Clara University and your work at Santa Clara and your long involvement there. I, I want to make sure that we cover that as part of, of this oral history. Can you talk a, a little bit about how you first became involved at Santa Clara and what, what promoted your interest in, in the university? Um, actually, uh, strangely enough, I think they contacted me. Um, uh, again, um, there was, and I'm missing his name right now, he's still there, uh, the, the president before Paul Locatelli. Um, he uh, was a Jesuit and he called and they were trying to um, figure out a way to engage in these new emerging industries around here. Um, and and uh, the way they were described as a university by some of the people in the community to me was you know, there's these adobe walls around it that you can't see in, and they like it that way. <laughs> um, but they wanted to open up more to the world. He wanted to open up more to the world. And so I, you know, basically put them through the same kind of process. Let's talk to the internal people and, and interview individuals there at the administration and then some of the professors, and then let's go out and talk to 
key people in the community. Um, and the focus of this was technology and, and what was happening in Silicon Valley. Try to get them more engaged in the community, yeah, because they knew intuitively from that area that if you're in this community, and they had been in it since 1850-something, um, that you know, it was no longer agriculture, um, it, and um, that it was really these new emerging industries, and they felt that it was essential to the survival and health of the university that they become more knowledgeable about it and prepare students for it. And so uh, that was the beginning. And uh, What did you find when you interviewed, uh, you, you, you put them through the Regis process? Yeah. What did you find? It was, it was uh, pretty uh, uh, um, isolating view that they, they were isolated. They were inside the adobe yeah, walls. They were inside the adobe walls and, uh, and um, you know, they, had, they were well respected. They had a high academic standards. Um, the graduates were you know, well prepared for the world um, academically. Um, and uh, it was a really fine school to go to. Um, but um, they really did lack any sort of sense of the current emerging industries and technologies. And, uh, um, and, and, uh, but that wasn't all universities. A lot of the universities had that same aspect. They were late coming into this. Um, Stanford didn't create a microelectronics uh, lab until the mid-80s. And the semiconductor industry had been around since the 50s. So, um, although they may have done work in semiconductors, it, you know, to really put a major commitment behind it um, happened later. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, and I'm a, I was on the advisory board at, at the Stanford Business School and the Haas School of Business at Berkeley and also Georgia uh, Tech University. So, I, I was able to see different universities and, and what they were trying to do in terms of engaging the technology people and the community and, and businesses in in the academic pursuits and the way to do that is one way is to bring in advisory boards on to every area from the industry which is the, the people you would do it it would be outside people and and the advisory boards uh, often became the members of the advisory boards became lecturers uh, guest lecturers at, at, uh, at the classes so this is again what happened to me was just being on the advisory boards I is starting to do guest lectures, lectures there um, um, and more and more programs there uh, centered on the, the technology. Um, there was a, um, a program they put there, they invited the, the uh, they had a, there's a thing called the uh, History of Technology Society and it's, it's all academics and they, present, they do an, an international journal and they had their annual meeting in, at Santa Clara back 15 years ago or 20 years ago and um, they had a, a person who was interviewing and the three people they were interviewing was um, Doug Engelbart, uh, Gordon Moore and me. And so um, the, th the three of us did this two hour long program of just questions and answers and, and where's the world going and uh, that was a that was so Santa Clara and then they would invite students that's where the students start getting more and more interested start asking questions um, they want to get uh, um, you know sort of uh, ways to do internships at companies um, my company we had interns from from uh, universities every summer we would take on uh, people to work for us um, Andy Grove's daughter worked for us I mean a lot of the People, my clients, they had their kids in school would, would work for us. Um, and, um, and it was great, I mean, because they worked hard, they were interested, they were, um, they participated. You know, they didn't do any of the, but we brought them into meetings with clients and so forth, but they weren't capable of giving much feedback, but they were learning. So it became an educational process for them. You, you were involved, as you said, um, in a, the advisory process at Berkeley and, and uh, also at, uh, at Georgia Tech. Um, what, what persuaded you to really go deep at Santa Clara? Was it this work that you were asked to do by the Yeah, by the and then I became a, a member of the, the, um, uh, the board of directors there um, and uh, very early. 
And so I, you know. This was um, as the university began to turn more outward or. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, what you find is, uh, um, like any university, it's very hard to influence it uh, in, in any rapid way. Uh, it, it's uh, some of the things I found when I, I, I was a, uh, a trustee, I say the board, but the board of trustees for 30 years. And I found myself in the last meeting fighting some of the same battles that I was fighting in the first one, you know. Um, and um, uh, because you just have so many different interests in the university and uh, universities don't want to change rapidly. Um, but um, because it just upsets too many upper parts um, and uh, they have to deal with the, the, the faculty uh, who have a, a board that they look to for their leadership and the student council. And, um, and there's all these various factions that come together. Um, but um, you're exposed to more and more of the deeper problems. You're uh, asked to help them in confidence. So we had um, almost like a company. Uh, unfortunately, Paul, Father Paul Locatelli was just an outstanding leader. And um, his reign, his reign came sort of coincidentally with my going on the board. He shortly became president shortly after. And so I was there most of the rise there, and that's where the campus changed, um, thanks to people uh, who went there, like John Sobrato, who was very active in the university and, and, its, and its, uh, its development, um, and, and just about everybody on the board. Uh, Jack Keeler, who was you know, former president of, of IBM, went there and also was on a trustee. Um, and so, you know, you met a lot of very fine, Mike Marco was a trustee. Um, so there was a lot of really fine people representing the Valley and... And, and representing technology in And particular. representing technology and speaking up. I mean, I think the big thing was that the early board meetings where you have, uh, you know, sort of, it's run by the, the administration um, and you're sort of quiet, you vote on a few things as ever. As the technology people kept coming in, there was things were challenged. Things were it was coming back at them. And I remember the the last meeting I was in, there was uh, uh, Mike Mar Marco's daughter and a few others, and uh, um, and a few other people I knew. A fellow from uh, was a product marketing manager at, at Intel, and then became a senior executive. Uh, he was there, and boy, they just kept they were challenging everything and. And uh, you didn't you didn't hold them down. They were up out of their seats on every issue. So uh, I felt that was really really good, and um, it, it needed that. Um, I think that uh, it's 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 improved as a university. Its academic standards are still very high. Um, it's respected. Uh, um, uh, it still hasn't uh, really been able to adopt the. the the sort of culture of technology that you see at um, uh, many other universities, though, that have really absorbed technology uh, in a full-blown way. Um, it's there, but it's sort of still hidden. Um, and, uh, you know, just getting the, the, the school network took forever. Um, and um, there's a technology committee and they just seemed to be the same people, and they were putting up the same proposals time after time after time. Mm -hmm. But I, but again, you know, um, it, it makes you. When I was young, I wanted. I always thought I'd go in, become a professor somewhere, and mm -hmm. um, I, and after thirty years on the trustee, I'm glad that I didn't. <laughs> it's just it's really hard. It's yeah. really hard to to move anything, and the, and everybody does get frustrated. And some people are, are happy to get their tenure and then ride it out. Um, but the, for those who continue to fight, but you do have a lot of, I think at Santa Clara, I, I got so many friends. Um, I, didn't, I didn't actually join the technology committee. Um, I, I was on the academic committee, so I was much more concerned with the overall academics. And I was on the uh, advisor board for um, the English department. And um, I felt that, um, with the rise of the internet, particularly that they could they could do uh, a traveling English class for uh, people who only knew how to write in 16 characters um, and things like that. And so um, 
you know, that was a lot of fun. And um, um, I think, again, the, the, the hanging around academics is, for some part of your life, is always, you know, it, uh, encouraging and, um, and gives you a lot of incentive to stay connected to uh, literature, stay connected to the advancements in technology and engineering and science, um, which you see all the time when you go there and when you're involved in the various subcommittees and, um, and board meetings. So the students are still as bright and as enthusiastic and they're, uh, they're sort of, when you're down, you have a bunch of students in to talk to you and you suddenly become lit up again. It's, it's uh, the young people are always filled with energy and excitement about the future. Talk a little bit about the, uh, the Center for Science, Technology, and Society, which you've been involved in. Yeah. Um, this came about, uh, I, I was told by the provost, uh, not the current one, but a past provost, that actually he got the idea from me. I gave a talk, I think, in which I had talked about the influence of, of technology on, on uh, society. And, um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the title of the center and you look at all the writing and, and work that you've done over the right. course of your career, th there's an immediate total overlap. Right. The, the, and, and, it, uh, and a, a fellow by the name of Jim Cook, who was uh, in the business school and uh, was very akin to, the con uh, to that whole idea and concept. And, um, and so he became the first director and I was uh, chair of it. And uh, we had uh, people like Bill David Al and, and many people from the industry on the advisory board there. And we would meet once a quarter. And uh, the, 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 it, I think it worked very well. We did, we, we, the whole idea was to sort of be, um, um, they have these various centers of excellence on the campus. And it was sort of like a hub and spoke the professors could engage with these centers and students could engage with them. And there were several different centers. There was the Ethics Center, there was the Center for Science, Technology, and Society, and a few other centers. And that they would be expertise and bring in outside people, bring in. So we would, we would hold, uh, uh, you know, conferences and, and, uh, and things of that nature that would address the subject of the center. And what was the hope for this center in particular? It was to come, uh, to come away with better knowledge and understanding of what's happening to us. How is, this, how is our science and technology so much coming out of this valley? How is it influencing our lives and, uh, and our societies and our governments? And, um, and um, you know, I think the, the, the sad thing about it was that it could never get funding from people in the valley. They were much more interested in the pragmatism of, of getting something specific done, not sort of an academic exercise of having students better understand um, what our society is about. And uh, they'd probably pay for their children's tuition, but not necessarily to have a, a study group to do that. And um, so it had a hard, very hard time getting funded. And um, so it always struggled for funding. And um, then there were some proposals um, about uh, doing um, more work in helping um, on entrepreneurial organizations around the world. So there's, uh, there are these local entrepreneurs in Africa, India, um, Latin America, who are starting companies for maybe just a village or two. Um, uh, solar panels that were uh, a lights that lit up a little hut, um, even uh, traveling uh, um, medical kits for delivering babies. Um, and, and these little businesses would do very well. And the whole idea was to um, find ways to scale that, even get outside funding for them. And, um, and there became a, a group that was very interested and active in that. Uh, at the center, and um, the, that's where Jeff Miller, who was at Intel, and I knew Jeff there as a product manager, um, high energy, uh, running a million miles an hour all the time, and then he became the president of Documentum, it was a big company over in East Bay, 
that was sold to IBM. <coughs> and so uh, he, he actually took over running it along with another woman there. And um, um, they have turned it into this sort of um, entrepreneurs around the world to try to affect and have impact on, I think they're talking about impacting five, 10 million people. Uh, in, in the environments and societies throughout the world. And it's doing very well doing that. Um, it just wasn't in sync with what I wanted to do. And so um, after, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, I sort of said, I'm retiring from it. You know, so I, I sort of stopped doing that. Um, I, I still think we need the, the answer to the bigger question. Um, and that might be my disposition for, you know, more philosophic view of things, but I still think we better got to better understand our society um, that that there are lots of other organizations that are helping these small companies grow. Yeah. And um, is there an academic <clears throat> outlet uh, for this this kind of thinking? I oh, mean, there the are many. I think there's a Centers for Science and Technology at Stanford. There's a, many. Almost all the major universities have them. Uh, you know, and they do serious you know academic work and papers and <coughs> produce journals. Now, I don't want to disparage it. It's now called the Miller Center because uh, Jeff uh, and his wife funded it and um, so sufficiently funded it to sustain itself. Um, and the students um, at the university um, work in teams and do go visit um, these places in Africa and Latin America and India and, and, and actually live and work with them for weeks at a time or months at a time and help them develop their infrastructure. And then they have an annual conference in, during the summer where they, um, the entrepreneurs, they select 30 or 40 of them to come to Santa Clara where over a course of, uh, I think it's over a course of about a month or six weeks, they are taught how to write business plans, how to raise money, how to, more of the business aspects of it. Well, and that seems very in sync with the, the the way Silicon Valley likes to see a center like that operated, yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, very and it, much and, yeah, a and it, and it, Silicon Valley take on things. Yeah, and it's working. You know, yeah. it's working. Yeah. Um, the third thing I wanted to talk about this morning in this session is uh, is your archives, uh, and th it's a multi part story, I think. But the the centerpiece of it is your notebooks, which we've referenced throughout the oral history and we'll have lots of pages of your notebooks uh, that you've given me just to illustrate so people will understand the nature of it. Uh, but just for the record, talk a little bit about, about your notebooks and your notebook system and what that, both what that meant to you, means to you and, and the kind of archive it represents. Yeah, um, first of all, I'm sort of a, a I'm an eclectic person, so I, I keep files and I keep artifacts and, and I have too much space filled with things that other people would call junk. Um, and, uh, and so I've collected stuff over the years and I got more and more interested in keeping stuff that my clients were making and, 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 um, and, and things of that nature. So I have a lot of boxes filled with, you know, chips and, and uh, devices and little gadgets and things like that. I even have a silicon ingot and uh, wafers and, and so forth out of the semiconductor industry. Um, and, and even, you know, brochures and articles and things of that nature. And, um, and largely I did it because so I could have my own reference system uh, for the, particularly the articles and things of that nature. Uh, the journals, I kept a journal when I was, you know, in high school and, um, and you know, sort of, excuse me, you know, put it away and then college picked it up and then put it away and, and I didn't use it for a lot of years but I created a journal and uh, but when I got into business uh, and uh, particularly as the business started growing I think initially I was probably doing it on just some papers or things but because of, I, I went to the notebook when I saw engin uh, engineers and, and particularly product marketing people keeping their notebooks and I um, thought, gee, that's a good way to keep track of everything because um, I might visit four or five clients in a day um, and, uh, long, you know, long days and certainly many more than that in a week. And then you have to do the work, so you have to go back and remember what it is that you, um, 
you were talking about and uh, indirect other people. So um, the whole idea of it was to sort of keep track uh, of what I was, the, the work process. It, it was not kept to as a journal as such to report on um, or to even go back and look at and read about what was going on in meetings and so forth at that time. Because a, a lot of the early stages, it was about products. Um, and, and I would say particularly Intel, um, there were so many new products that we were working on and so many new areas of technology and, uh, and they would have lots and lots of meetings and sessions on them that um, you were keeping track of the product and the features and the benefits and the plans and when it was going to be announced and how it might be announced and what they needed to overcome or to achieve. Um, an example of this might be um, um, when they came out with bubble memory, um, they had a, the architecture of the bubble memory had to be actually very similar to the core memory, the little ferrite car, cores that there's probably some here in the museum that you can go see. Um, and um, it had to be structured the way the architecture of a bubble of a core memory was built. Very much the same kind of input and output um, patterns. And so you go through this whole history of sort of computing storage based upon these really primitive technologies that have evolved to the current day technology and, and, and even you know solid state memory. And, and the people who ran these things would go through this sort of little history of, of it for you. And, and what were the issues and how do we overcome that and so forth. So it was almost like a mini class. It was always, yes, itself. almost every one of these are mini classes that, you know, you, you know, and what strikes you as interesting, you write down and, and, and so forth. Um, there, were, there, there really wasn't any long-term goal to doing the notebooks, but I kept them. And, um, and I ended up with, uh, uh, you know, notebooks from, I, I think probably it started around the end of 70, 1971 uh, or 72. And um, I have, I've kept notebooks. It can range from, depending upon the workload, um, two to five notebooks a year. Um, and I've kept those notebooks uh, going up till today. Um, and, um, um, and certainly through the history of my business from, from then until into the, you know, the 20, 2005 or 2010 when I uh, really stopped doing it. Um, and uh, so now going back at them, um, there were some in which they were much more elaborate prose about what was going on and others in which there's just sort of an outline of the product. Uh, sometimes little funny sketches. Uh, I would include strange stuff, uh, um, you know, personal things, uh, um, um, reviews of, of employees, um, um, you know, just, just whatever was on, you know, sort of like a scratch pad that was in front of me all the time. And even when I was on the phone, I would be taking notes. Uh, so I had, uh, you know, phone calls that I would write notes on. Like I used to get, quite often get phone calls from Steve Jobs and uh, even after, you know, he left Apple. And so I would record those just my memory or whatever. Um, and when your notebooks on your Apple work in particular, which yeah. you've shown me, are, are, are very deep and, and very detailed. And yeah. not only include what happened, but your own interpretation of events as they were happening. Right. And, and uh, I think uh, when you look at Intel notes versus that, it's, it's really kind of interesting because uh, they, were, they were clients at the same time. And... Um, uh, Intel was very organized, very process oriented, very direct. You know, you, you had goals, you know, milestones, uh, objectives and accomplishments and they were, everything was in process. And therefore, do your notes reflect that? So your notes reflect that. Very structured. Apple was, you know, it, 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 you know, it was, a, it was a hacker kind of thing. It was a, a random access <laughs> and random thoughts. And, um, and discussions and so forth. So it, it just became very interesting. And Apple, um, I always felt from the beginning of putting together their program that it was, uh, in my mind, a story. 
um, you know, two young dropouts uh, with the name Apple, which is an, you know, sort of all American, and the, the multicolored logo that we created uh, put them aside as sort of the psychedelic era of the 60s. And, um, and so Apple became an American story, and that's the way it was written. And, um, and so it was a story you wanted to follow and see where it was going. And so that's, that became part of my notebooks, um, was really the Apple story. And um, I think that, you know, certain portions of that, maybe a lot of it, uh, make interesting reading, um, even if it's not published, but it's just in notebooks. Um, I still find it interesting. And it's, um, um, uh, you know, when people come out with books on Apple, I can check the records. And, um, and as you saw, I have calendars that have the, the meeting dates and so forth as well, all noted. So um, some, some, some companies are much more interesting that way and others aren't. And um, so I try to record the, the feeling of what was going on. I think the period when, uh, of the Mac intro um, which um, my first notes on the Mac came about. Uh, the Mac was introduced in 1985, uh, and my first notes were like in 1982, the first meetings to discuss it. And then over the ensuing years, it, it, it got more and more elaborate in terms of what it was, what it was going to be, what they'd like it to be. And in the meantime, you know, they had, were developing the, the Lisa. Um, and um, off to the side, I have notes on when Steve read in the papers about it being Lisa being his uh, his uh, daughter uh, and his reaction to that. Um, and so those kinds of things are in there. Um, the meetings, I was fortunate to be on Apple's executive staff, um, which was all the key decision maker and operations people. Um, there's probably 20 people in the executive staff, maybe not that many. Um, and that uh, was on that from about 83 to 88. Um, and uh, that was the key people period in which the Macintosh came to fame, collapsed. Um, Steve left and, uh, and Scully took over. And um, um, I kept very detailed notes during those periods. Um, and uh, I have, a, I do have a, um, a hold on those until sometime in the future, because I don't particularly want to have them published at this point. Let's talk about that and about what's happened with those notebooks. So you've you've made a gift of those, many of your notebooks, not all of them, but but uh, more than a hundred. Yeah, actually, all of them. Uh, all of them. I just haven't. Uh, Transferred to Transferred the, the them all to Stanford, yeah. but they're all going to Stanford. Yeah. Yes. And largely because, um, you know, um, I started, um, I got to know Leslie Berlin, who uh, is the archivist for me over there. And um, when she was doing, I think probably in the early days when she was doing the book on Bob Noyce. And um, I got to know her. And of course, I had a lot of stuff on Intel and, and Noyce. And, um, uh, you know, he never really... Uh, published anything, and there wasn't. There's not that much that you can read on him, but I do have some, a lot of interviews and things like that, and even uh, I took notes on interviews for, with him, and uh, and I let her use my notebooks, and um, and she approached me on getting them into the Stanford Library where they could be accessible to researchers, and uh, they'll be at some point in the future uh, accessible to anybody that wants to do research on either my firm or Apple or Intel or other technologies. What I've done in the meantime is, it's, um, um, as I've been working on lately, is taking, um, let's say Apple, which we started in, uh, as a client in 1976, before they were incorporated. And I wrote the sort of an outline of the first marketing plan. And then all the way up till right shortly before Steve died, um, so sort of I have notes on that over many, many books and many years. Um, I'm taking all the Apple subjects from each of the books and putting them all in one file. And same with Intel, same with about most of the, the major clients. 
So you don't have to go both through all the books to, to see all the Apple stuff. You can just go into one file and look at, and they're dated and, um, and referenced. So um, You're curating your own collection. Right, because I'd be the best one to do it. There's some things that it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to go in there. No, they're just, you know, 10 minute meeting or something and it, nothing was said of, of vital interest. So I would leave those out. But majority of the, of both Intel and Apple and Spectrophysics and uh, a company called MeasureX, which was the, the first, you know, uh, manufacturing digital company. Um, and uh, probably 30, 40 clients that I had over the years, I've, I've broken out into separate folders. Um, and so researchers will be able to just go in and look at any one of those, uh, if they can read my writing. Uh, but it's fairly, you know, at times fairly legible. Um, and now that you have an, another part of your, your personal collection, your, your, your clips, papers you've written, manuscripts, other things, that's a completely separate set no, of... No, it all goes It all goes to Stanford. All that goes yeah, to Stanford. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the contents of the rest of that, uh, that article. Well, um, um, I have, uh, for example, uh, have boxes and boxes of, um, of presentations that our company made to companies and, and then the workbooks that we did for them. <coughs> the research that we did. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I had... Uh, um, excuse me. I had uh, some people who worked for me who kept very good records as well, and they gave all those documents to me. And so I was able to have whole discussions on various businesses that, um, uh, for example, with, um, uh, let's say, uh, um, one of our clients was open source. Um, uh, association, which was promoting open source, uh, um, the um, we we there's probably a, a, somewhere between ten and a dozen key technologies that we were responsible for helping to educate the market on, from uh, um, from Ethernet, you know, to the PC to um, uh, microprogramming um, and so forth. I mean, it's uh, it, it's an extensive list, and um, and so you know, drawing conclusions from that, um, uh, I really haven't done, and uh, I'm, I may have to do at some point. But uh, all of the sort of notebooks and things that were separate from that, separate presentations, um, so I gave them twenty boxes of material, um, and I still have um, all my clipping files which are um, easy, another four or five boxes of just magazine clippings. And that includes, um, I, I probably have uh, algorithms, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, uh, networking, um, um, choice, uh, an eclectic subject matter that when I, uh, when I was doing books or other things. But I just clipped everything that was of interest. And then I would, and during my time uh, in my company, <clears throat> I talked before about the little FYI stickers. And so I would do uh, clippings of, let's say, things on uh, the computer industry or the personal computer industry, article I read on IBM or something that some other Sony was doing or whatever. And I would tear that out, copy it, put an FYI sticker, and I'd put, you know, Steve Jobs, John Scully, and so forth on it. And so I would constantly be sending these little clippings out to my clients, specifically to things that they would be interested in. Um, and then we had created a, um, a thing called um, Econs, and I don't think I have any other copies of that, unfortunately. You know, over moving over the years, a lot of stuff did get lost. Um, but the Econs were uh, books that we prepared about once a quarter, and they were all just charts and graphs that were published. Uh, started out on the SIA and trade and economic changes and, and by country, um, pricing. Anywhere you go in a magazine and see a chart, um, particularly things like Financial Times, um, the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, Fortune, these people who, who you know, used a lot of graphics, 
and uh, it's probably illegal, but we made copies of all those charts. But they were usually referenced somebody else, you know, um, an, uh, an organization, and we would reference those organizations. And then I would make copies of all those charts and graphs and publish them as a book. And I would send them to not only my clients, but I send them to people who aren't clients, uh, executives, just to sort of continue to show them what was happening in our trying to. I was wanted to try to be part of the industry rather than sort of a an appendage or a supplier. I didn't want to be a supplier. I wanted to be a part of it, and um, that sort of ingrained us as being a part of it. And that certainly, um, I think, played out with uh, so many of the people that we got to know and work with. And this uh, this collection in the future will be publicly available at some point, all of it. So any any researcher can go over to Stanford right. and, and just roll up their sleeves and and begin to do the work. Yeah, I, and, and part of that is um, because I do have a lot of commentary at times that is, um, you know, I mean, it, it's maybe what it would embarrass people or, and, and I sort of felt that, you know, I was there, uh, let's say the Apple meetings, I was there um, as a, as a, I was there as they actually made me sort of a, an active member. I voted whether Steve should stay or go. I voted on issues. Um, but I was also there at their good graces. And, um, and because I was a consultant. And uh, um, I, I just didn't want to sort of violate that. And so um, it's probably past due now. But still in all, there's some things that could, could certainly embarrass people. Well, I, I totally understand that because the Computer History Museum is doing contemporaneous history and, and that's got its ups and downs. Yes. Uh, and on the one hand, it's very exciting to be able to sit down and talk to someone like you who, who represents so much history and so much knowledge. Uh, on the other hand, contemporaneous history is, is tough because there are differing views and there are personal feelings and all of that is kind of caught up in it. And that's why, for that reason, I wanted to get on the record as part of this oral history uh, a, a couple of things. First of all, that that archive exists at Stanford. And second of all, Ideally, this oral history and that archive can be used in tandem with each other so that people who are discovering things that you and I have talked about that they may not have known about right, right. can then go over there and, and do the actual research. Well, I, I think part also, I think um, I felt particularly in my family too, close to Steve Jobs. And, um, and um, you know, we, we and, and he may have had that with lots of people, I'm, I'm not sure. But, you know, when he would call, particularly like on a Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening or so forth, and we'd chat, um, there were very personal kind of conversations. <clears throat> and I felt that much of has been written on Steve Jobs is not really him. Um, no one really is really, you know, it's the elephant somebody touches and, and a blind people touching the elephant and all you know, describing a different experience. Um, I, I think that it depended on where you encountered him and in what circumstance determined your view of Steve. Uh, and so much is what people want him to be uh, rather than what he was. Um, certainly a man with, you know, uh, uh, defects, uh, but also somebody who uh, gave his life to, quite frankly, te the technology and the development of Apple. and. Um, and, and was in sincere in what he was doing. Um, and I, I think that, I think hopefully my no notebooks shed a little light on that um, because it's, it's word for word what he said. And, um, you know, we're, uh, and I can say this in some meeting where, um, you know, when, when he, people were beating him up at the executive staff over sort of the Mac um, being the, uh, uh, he was trying to get everything to be the Mac, and the, it was this, there was this debate between the Apple II and the Mac. You have two different platforms, each, say, trying to get the education market, each trying to get the small business market, each of them conflicting. And the Apple II actually kept getting its resurgence by upgrading its products, where the Mac was sort of 
at least initially, it was static. And it wasn't till later that it really upgraded. And so Steve was sort of obstinate in, in, in trying to get all the resources over to one platform. And, and he didn't have a lot of experience in management. He didn't have a lot of experience in how to work with a, you know, a structure within a structure. He was much more of somebody that worked outside a structure his whole life. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, he, at one point he, he basically said, you know, I, I really want help. He said this in the meeting, I really want to learn more about management. You know, he said, I've, I've spent, you know, I've been, I, you know, I've had, I've, 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 I became a, a founder of Apple when all of a sudden I've got all these people that, you know, uh, that I have to manage and I have no management skills. And he said, you know, if, if, if I were at some company, I think he used something like uh, Kodak. He says, if I were at Kodak and, and I became a, an asshole, they'd fire me. He said, but I had no one here to fire me when I, when I was a jerk. And, and he told everybody that. So he knew, you know, that when he was out of bounds, he knew it. You didn't have to tell him. Uh, and there were a couple of people that could tell him. Um, I told him several times, you know, to knock it off. And uh, Ann Bowers was very good at telling him as well. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure there were others. But, um, you know, and he always was, was apologetic and he was always uh, back off. Um, I know one time he treated uh, my assistant very rudely on the phone and I told him, don't you ever do that again or you're going to find somebody else working for you. And, um, and he called her up and apologized. Um, and so, you know, he, he, uh, he had this sort of yin and yang personality, but I think he, I, I always felt that he sort of always felt that he only had so many days in his life. I don't know why, but I think he, he was sort of that melancholy uh, conscience, and I think he was in a hurry to get everything done, and that sort of drove him. And, um, and much of this is reflected in your yeah. notebooks and in your notes. And, yeah. uh, you have insights about him that right. no one else has, and they're unique to your time with him. Yeah. All right, we're back in this section of the oral history to talk about uh, topics that are very specific to the Exponential Center and entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, first of all, Regis, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about your work beyond Silicon Valley and, and other areas, for example, as your membership on the advisory board of Toyota and as an advisor in other high-tech regions of the world? The, 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 uh, the Toyota thing is, was very interesting. And um, I, I've, you know, I had an office in Tokyo, and, and I have some Japanese friends that I've known for long, long periods of time. Um, um, one who was also an, an advisor, not on the advisory board there, but also it was a senior advisor. To, uh, uh, to Toyota, and um, he's the one that recommended me. They started this advisory board, um, I believe in like the mid-1990s. Um, and, the, and they had a, I, uh, I, I was looking, at, I looked up and saw the names of the, that were on that advisory board, and there were at least three on there that were no longer on it when I joined. So I have a feeling that there, there were some people that left and then they brought on new members, and so uh, they were looking for um, a few new members. And I believe that me and a fellow by the name of John Jennings went on the board about roughly at the same time. Um, it was a, co a collection of people um, that uh, the chairman, um, Hiroshi Okuda, um, had sort of commissioned to create. And, I, and the board of directors at Toyota uh, were uh, operating people at Toyota. So they ran different divisions. You know, they would run the research operation or manufacturing or those sorts of things or different models of cars. And so it was senior executives at the company. It was, it was fairly insular. And I think he felt that they needed more outside in uh, influence and, and conversations. So they decided to get people who had some view of the world um, other than Toyota's view and, and put that together in an advisory board. And um, we met a couple times a year for at least two days, sometimes longer. Um, 
and that would be separate meetings. Uh, and uh, it was with the board of directors of Toyota. And, um, and it was uh, people from uh, just about every continent in the, in the world. Um, there was, uh, um, and I did write some of the names down because I went back and, and sort of looked them up. Um, there was uh, Bob Hermatz, who was actually, um, he was uh, a senior member of the, the, the Kissinger Consulting Group. Um, he also uh, became vice chairman of Goldman Sachs. And he had a real global view of uh, uh, the economies in different countries. Uh, he was very close at watching China and some of those industries. There was a guy named um, um, Chin Chao, who was the chairman of China Merchant Bank, which is the largest merchant bank in China. He's still chairman of it. Um, he was really wonderful global insights, particularly into what China was doing. And uh, he was educated in Australia, so he had a, a little bit of a Western influence as well. Um, there was um, uh, Paul Volcker, former chairman of the, uh, of the um, Federal Reserve. Um, there was a fellow who was uh, from Brazil who was the ambassador to the United States at one point. There was um, um, a fellow who was the, um, and his name was uh, uh, Pedro, Pablo Pedro K uh, Kaczynski. And he actually left in the middle of his term when I was there. And he, he left to become uh, a f um, Minister of, of Finance for Peru and became uh, uh, prime minister. And then most recently, he was before the current president, he was president of Peru. And um, he, was, he was also a really, I mean, these are very nice, marvelous people to sit around and just talk, tell stories and so forth. And, um, um, and, and there were several others, but they represented more global views. So, so excuse me, the so subject matter <clears throat> was, um, wasn't anything to do with marketing. It had to do, or with, uh, for that matter, technology. <clears throat> Though I was on there because of my knowledge of technology and Silicon Valley and, and sort of the cultural mores of it. And um, so, for example, um, they would ask a question whenever the U.S. was poised to go into Iraq. The question was, um, what influence will that have on, on, on companies doing global businesses in the Middle East and around the world. What should we be prepared for? What should we look out for? Um, there were questions um, uh, when a new president here in the United States came on board, what should we expect? What, so it was, it was political, social, cultural, and I made a couple presentations on the social influences of technology, um, which Paul Volcker got up and mimicked. Um, yeah, he's a very funny guy, and um, in, in a nice sort of way. But, um, uh, you know, if you attended these sessions over a period of five years, it was like having um, uh, a course in international economics and culture uh, from people who lived it. Oh, there was John Jennings was the, uh, the chairman of the Shell um, distribution companies. And so he was a very senior geologist, senior brother. There was a fellow um, who was the, came out of the United Nations and he was the chairman of the United States, or United Nations uh, Commission on Environment. Um, and um, uh, and he, uh, he, he was very outspoken about the environmental issues. Um, so that was, I think it was pretty much courageous of them to put people like that on the board. But a lot of them were common interest of being having some sort of political influence or some sort of political culture. And I think that's because there was a guy, I think his name was Martin Lee, who, who helped a coup to put together the board. And he was a senior official in the United Nations at one point. And so I think he picked people that he knew from his world. <laughs> and then later on, they started getting uh, people in more diverse industries. Um, I think they've re they they, they uh, abandoned it um, after uh, John Jennings and I were the last of that era. 
um, and um, and then they they stopped having an advisor board. But then I understand they picked it up again later. I thought it was just a marvelous way for any company. Um, they don't have to have that sort of a high level influence, but they have an advisory board that's sort of global in their outlook and uh, and can give objective perspective. Mm -hmm. Any one of those people, uh, 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 Bob Hermatz, uh, John Jennings, um, could have been on the board of Toyota, you know, and they would have been able to make positive contributions. They were mature enough to uh, to uh, not simply be polite for Japanese sake, but to say what they think uh, the issues were and put it right flat on the table in front of them. Um, and, and that's the way the advisor board was. It was it was uh, peer to peer. It was not, uh, um, you know, oh, we're here uh, as a, a, a subservient to the board. Um, they never felt that way. And we had wonderful times afterwards. We'd go out, often go out to a, a bar and um, 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 Paolo, Pedro Paolo Kaczynski, he, he liked Irish whiskey and told me that he knew where all the bars on the served Irish whiskey in Japan were, so we would always head out there and, uh, and they would tell stories. I mean, uh, Volk, uh, Paul Volcker would talk about fishing and, and uh, you know, they were, they were just normal people with, you know, a lot of brilliance up here and, uh, and a lot of experience in their, in their careers. And they could bring, uh, they could offer a great deal to Toyota. One of the things I want to attach to this segment is uh, the essay that, that you gave me about uh, the economic, social, and political impact of 9-11. Yeah, that was one of the things that they uh, um, asked was one of the, they give you projects before each meeting to prepare. So you would do a statement on each of these and everybody on the, on the advisory board would do that. and. Um, and um, you would sort of give a synopsis of it um, rather than ever everybody read the complete and then they would publish the, the, the full statement. And, um, and I also wrote several articles for Toyota's uh, internal newsletter uh, on technology and cultural change in society. You had offices around the world and as a result you got pulled into advisory roles in other high tech regions, whether formal or, or informal, uh, right. Toyota was certainly a formal role. Can you talk about other, other regions where you have been active? Um, in many areas I was uh, asked to give advice on either development of um, regional venture funds uh, such as in, as in um, uh, Barcelona. Uh, I was at a conference there where I was asked to advise uh, the local fathers on whether or not they should build a public venture capital fund um, and um, I was opposed to it. Um, you know, one of the things I was opposed to was that they wanted to have a, a public fund of something like 150 million in US dollars and I just thought that was peanuts and so I, uh, one question I asked them is, so what if you lose 100 million of that? And well, they couldn't do that, they said. <laughs> I said, well, if you're doing venture, it's always a possibility. And so, um, you know, they, that would be too politically dangerous for them to lose money. And so I think they sort of thought, you go into venture capital, you make a lot of money and you support a lot of companies, but it's not that easy. And, and most people in other areas of the world, including um, the uh, Minister of Trade at Japan, I did. Um, I told you I did uh, uh, advice indirectly for Japan uh, with Bechtel the big construction firm, when they were charged to build a, uh, a, a technopolis center in, uh, um, in northern Australia. Um, and uh, there was going to be a technopolis center in Italy. Uh, the governor of uh, Montana came down to see me uh, about, you know, they were all copper mining and other kinds. He wanted to get into more clean industries and technology and um, ask about how they might do that. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, and we indirectly got into that by a fellow that was one of my early uh, partners in my firm, Don Coburn, who did this uh, uh, plant location work for Bob Noyce at Fairchild. 
And so Moise had called him after he went to work for me and asked him to help them locate a plant up in Oregon. So that's how Intel went to Oregon was through, um, through indirectly our, our work. Um, and, uh, but anywhere people were looking at trying to create centers of, of entrepreneurism, things of that nature, we tended to, I, I, had a, I was involved in a lot of them um, and made my comments and so forth. But I, and, and I think probably the most successful of that was Ireland. Um, and, and Ireland had a, when I first went there, um, you know, it was dirt roads, communication was poor, the hotels were terrible. Uh, you know, the, the roof sleeked in your room, the, the services were bad. Um, um, you know, they had, they had been under, you know, four, 500 years of British rule. Um, um, and, and um, you know, just all the services were, were absent. And um, they joined the um, common market and that allowed money to be invested in them from the other countries. That were, the wealthy countries wanted to balance things out. So there was funding for the poorer countries that came in to try to bring them up to a level. Well, one of the things that Italy, uh, Ireland had versus other countries was they had a 98% um, a literacy rate. It was higher than, than the United States. They had very good education systems all through the, the elementary and up into college, but everybody left after college. And so the population continued. It went from something like uh, five million in the uh, before the famine in the 1840s, uh, down to almost two million. It was about two and a half million to, to three million, and um, students would continue to leave the country because there were no jobs. So the idea of creating a high tech community um, really was uh, interesting to them. And uh, the first thing that and I had read a study about where are, where are high-tech firms located, uh, entrepreneurial firms, and they're located where there's other big firms because they tend to spin out from big firms and they tend to have a, uh, for example, here in Silicon Valley, it's, uh, it's, there's 15 companies, uh, roughly 15 companies that, um, that produce uh, almost a trillion dollars in revenue in Silicon Valley. They're big companies. Um, and that's the stability of this technology here. They're diverse companies, some software, biotech, hardware, uh, um, AI, uh, chips. Um, and so that creates an economic stability for the small companies to use their services that they've developed as, as a support community. And often the consultants that move out or whatever from, so it creates an ecosystem. And, um, uh, and how Ireland got that, they had to have some big companies there. And it really didn't matter so much what they did. It had to do with just having those presence where people could work and begin to get the whole idea of how technology companies uh, operate. And, um, and so we set out to uh, uh, entice companies. We made a list of companies, first of all, with um, Irish roots in the senior management. Um, with uh, people who liked to golf, because we would take people on golfing tours there. But then we had, they had some companies there that um, wanted to set up shops so they could essentially uh, export uh, duty-free into Europe, the European market, and have it manufactured there. And there were several pharmaceutical companies, and they become, uh, you know, I said, let's use those as models so that they could go in and see a clean room see the, the you know, assembly line, see people doing things that are certainly health oriented. They had to be, you know, uh, to certain specifications. And uh, so there were these kinds of things were set up as an infrastructure. And then there was simply introducing people um, to, um, the one thing I had them do almost immediately was set up an office here in Silicon Valley that you, you have to go to all the events, you have to be there you can't operate from Ireland or New York and try to influence Silicon Valley. You got to go to the AEA meetings. You got to go to the conferences. You got to go to the, uh, the yearly SIA conference and, and rub elbows with these people and get to know them. And they did. And they put a fairly good sized staff here. And the, the vehicle for this is the Ireland Development Authority, 
right? That's yes. that the IDA. Is yeah, really IDA was the Irish Development the Authority. Yes, yeah. yes. and um, and uh, gradually, you know, we got uh, some really marquee companies fairly early on. We had uh, Amdahl um, and um, 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 Intel was fairly early in there, and uh, uh, eventually Apple. And Apple got in there because of I helped uh, get the information in through uh, Ann Bowers, Bob Noyce's wife, who was running HR at um, at Apple, and then then she brought it to the executive staff's attention, and and that got their interest peaked. Um, and um, so we 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 worked the ground. We operated as sort of agents to help them develop the business. And uh, it was, as I said, it was it. it it not only changed the country, it changed the economics, it um, provided jobs, it, it improved the education system because now people didn't move to other countries, they stayed there and worked in the education system. As you know, you've been there and you've been to the, the universities there, they're really fine universities. They are. And, um, uh, and there's a tremendous high-tech base tremendous established high -tech. in yes. Ireland now. Yes. In fact, Dublin is the center of uh, a lot of technology, right. uh, corporate headquarters for all of Europe. Right. So it went from a, a really third world country, you know, to a, a, you know one of the top industrial companies in the world, and um, and it was given not much credit to be able to do that. There were some really pejorative articles that were published about. Um, that if I, Ireland um, got involved in these kinds of industries, it would just, they would destroy them. You know, they would go on strike. They would uh, have, be able to come up with no ideas. They would be so. There was a, you know, the Irish were sort of the, the tail end of the. They're the way people think of Hispanics today, quite frankly, or, or you know, uh, people of color. Um, they really were treated that way. Even when they came to the United States, there were signs in the windows in Pittsburgh that said, uh, Irish need not apply. Um, so they were looked at as, uh, as you know, a back end of the race. And, um, but yet, uh, both through politics and through technology, they were able to, and education, they were able to essentially create uh, a model for the rest of the world. Let's talk now about your mentoring, Regis. You've been a mentor to a couple of generations of, of people, at least, uh, in marketing, uh, in technology, but beyond technology, too. Talk a little bit about your, your approach to being a mentor and, and your feeling about talent development. Well, um, there's, um, there's a couple things. One is, um, we were working with really leading edge companies. I mean, and we were working with mostly in the, those entrepreneurial days with the, uh, the senior managements. <clears throat> so the working at Intel in the early days, you were, you were working, um, maybe not directly working with product marketing people, but encountering Bob Noyce or Gordon Moore in meetings was, was quite common. I mean, you'd see them there, you could you know, talk to them regularly about things. And, um, and, and Andy Grove came and <clears throat> became, you know, a, a key driver there. And, um, and Andy, I think Andy liked sticking his nose into marketing. He was, he was a, you know, he was a communicator. And, um, and um, we got to work closely together very early. Les Fidesz was another driver, founder. And uh, Les is still a lifelong friend. And, um, but they... And many of the other companies um, absorbed us like employees. You weren't an outside vendor. You were part of the team. And that's the way we were at Apple. That's the way we were at Intel. That's the way we were at almost all of the initial startups that we worked for. Um, I never had a badge at Intel or Apple. Um, you just sort of walked in. You were part of the team, and, and people recognized you. And so. Um, and, and you could bring in people from your company who, who initially, I have two young fellows that work for me back in the 70s um, that are in business for themselves now, but we get together every now and then. And the last time was just a couple months ago, we had lunch and they were just, again, raving of the fact and appreciative of the fact 
that they were able to sit in meetings with Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore and people like that, that um, they said, you know, that as a young person, it, it was so um, life-changing for them to, to be, participate in meetings with them and have conversations with them and, and, to, and to hear how they talk and what they saw, how they thought. And they, they were, it, it, was, it was a life-changing experience. And um, I think that we did a lot of training. Uh, we had a, a huge training center. Um, I brought in people from the outside. Uh, I brought in um, people from Stanford, professors, to give talks on marketing and business. We had, um, for example, uh, even clients, I would have the, when the quality problem arose, I had the head of uh, quality control at Intel come up and talk to all my employees about how, how they, how the process was like, what they did, how they did it, and what were the key issues. Um, so we'd have outside, we had an uh, international marketing advisory board that included the, the head of R&D from Toyota, uh, from Sony, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Toy, and, um, and Dave House was on that, Bill David Al was on that, so we'd have these discussions on marketing in the contemporary times, and those were recorded, and they were all in a, a big session with employees around the sides, and, um, and we really pushed education in a big way. Had a lot of a lot of off sites, so anything that I, all the presentations I would do outside, I would do them inside usually first, and uh, to the employees, and uh, um, we tried to discover and create. Uh, uh, products or uh, in the service sense, um, you know, uh, uh, market check was a way of going out and doing a analysis of the changes in the marketplace, the competition, the, uh, uh, the changes that have occurred over the last year or, occur or about to change and do an audit of, of sort of the the, the marketplace by talking to analysts, talking to customers, and getting feedback and putting that together in what I call a market check program. It was very laid out as to specifics. Um, we did the uh, internal and inter external audits, uh, talking to the senior managements and then talking to their, their prime customers, and then comparing inside and outside views. Um, all of that led to, uh, while we were doing sort of the implementation as well, but that led to sort of a, a, a marketing phase of, um, that moved us further and further to a consulting business. And that happened throughout the 90s. So it was a, the mentoring process within, within your firm was both a, a personal one-on-one -on -one process and also it was a, almost a process of osmosis, right? You were exposing people at at all levels, very junior people in many cases, yes, yeah. to real opportunities for growth if they just were capable of taking advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. So they tell me. I mean, you know, <laughs> and 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 I. I mean, I have. Uh, I think I told you one, one employee who worked for me for a number of years um, told me that um, that uh, you know uh, I gave him not just a job but a career, so he was able to take that experience and then move into more senior marketing positions in other companies. Um, and, and I've met a lot of product marketing people who have said, uh, um, you know, you taught me a lot about uh, marketing. Um, I, this sounds a little bit self-promoting, uh, um, but uh, at the last uh, Intel conference that was here at the Computer Museum, uh, Andy Grove was there. And, um, and when I walked up the steps and he came over and he gave me a big hug and he said, my teacher. And, um, and I said, boy, I wish you had said that a long time ago. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I think we spent a lot, a lot of hours arguing, but, but Andy was always uh, open to, to ideas and, and eventually he would uh, turn around and, and if it's a good idea and, and adopt it. And Steve was the same way. Steve Jobs was very much the same way. And, um, and basically told me the same thing after the, the iPod introduction and I was in the audience and he came down and gave me a hug and, and said, you know, you started all this. And so uh, those are sort of little personal moments of, of reward. 
Is there a sense in which mentoring uh, that, let me ask this another way. You have described a process by which people develop the skills and the talent and the knowledge they needed to grow and to excel. Um, th that may or may not involve what we're, what we today call mentoring, which I think is in the minds of probably people who wanted this question asked, uh, much more of a one-on-one -on -one situation where you really take someone under their, your wing and you, and you explicitly mentor them. You, what you're talking about is not really that, is it? It's much more of a, um, uh, here it is, I'm exposing you to everything you could possibly need to succeed. It's up to you to take advantage of that. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I mean, certainly um, we did classes. Um, there was a fellow that worked for me, uh, Rob Brownstein, and he was an engineer engineer. And, um, and he taught classes on basic technology at our class, and I think most of them are re recorded. Um, and it was just, what is electronics? How does it, how's, what is it? And, and he taught those classes to uh, new, em new employees. And, um, and I think almost all of the technology companies, and particularly Intel, had uh, classes that they taught new employees how to uh, benefit from the culture of Intel. And um, so I had a lot of tutors myself, and those tutors were my clients. And, and bringing young people into meetings with, as I said, who, who saw you not as a vendor but as a part of the team, when you brought young people in on that as part of a team, the mentors became the product marketing people who gave you the history, who gave you the why we're doing this, who gave you much more than, than simply uh, go do this. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and Intel was really good at the fact. Most, most I think, product marketing people uh, who have an engineering degree and usually some you know, MBA or business degree, um, they have the ability to take a broader perspective and to package it in a way, in a presentation. So the, the product marketing people, um, uh, exposed me and a lot of our people to uh, the technology and the process and the rationale and so forth. And, uh, and, and these were people that are well known in Silicon Valley. Uh, product marketing people were, you know, people like John Doerr um, and Dave House and Bill Davidell and people of that nature who are now, you know, uh, they became venture capitalists later on. and and very influential in our society, but they were people who uh, were many times leading the teams that we were involved in on projects at either Intel or Apple. In fact, that's uh, where Daniel Lewin, the president of now of the Computer Museum, was at, you know, I knew him at Apple back when, when he was uh, running the education programs mm -hmm. and became friends. And, uh, and um, so, um, you know, he was close to Steve, and um, so Daniel and I crossed paths quite a few times over the years. And um, they were all, they're all really teachers, because their job was to take what they learned from engineering and com communicate it to customers uh, or potential customers. That was their job, and we helped facilitate that mm -hmm. and, um, and create new ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, so as part of that team, we were always in the classroom, always. I always, I always looked at everything we did as being part of a classroom, and that marketing is an educational process, learning more about the market, and the customer learning more about you and your products. So it's a, it's a closed loop. Now let's talk about some, um, there are five questions here that are common to, I think, all, all the oral histories uh, being done for the Exponential Center. Let's talk about them. Uh, first of all, uh, a significant professional mistake or failure or something that didn't work out the way you had expected it to and the, the lessons you learned from that. You, you've said several times in, in these interviews the, the famous line from Bob Noyce about maybe, maybe, some don't, maybe enough don't fail or maybe more should fail. Right. Because 
failure as a way to learn a lesson. Uh, yeah. Talk about that for a minute. Yeah, those sort of little homilies are really uh, comforting, but they hurt when they happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think probably um, the, uh, I think if, uh, and I've said this, although it's, uh, it was sort of beyond my control, but I think if, if I were to start a company in the marketing business, I would have uh, at least one partner or two partners to share the, t the name of the company. Um, because everybody wants you. If your name's on the door, that's the person that uh, they want to talk to. And so you, you get spread really, really thin. And as we grew, it became harder and harder. Um, you know, I, I was traveling, you know, more than 200,000 miles a year. Um, and uh, and I've, I've showed you copies of my calendars. It was, they were jam-packed. And doing that for 30 years uh, was, uh, was exhausting. Um, I also created uh, an alliance with, uh, at the time it was called Pete Marwick, it's now KPMG. Uh, Pete Marwick, uh, there was a phase at which they wanted to get into the consulting business. They were obviously one of the, the big three or the big four or big five, whatever it was at the time, uh, um, accounting firms and did audits and they made their money make doing audits. And, uh, but they had a consulting group, a, a technology consulting group and um, they were very interested. They had bought uh, a couple companies in the technology uh, area. Uh, one back in uh, Boston called Nolan Norton, and they were a uh, an IT consulting firm. And um, we we partnered with them on a number of things. They were very, we, and we worked very well with them. Um, and uh, and uh, they bought a company out or person of a company out here that was in manufacturing consulting. Um, and so they were trying to get into that business and they had presented to us to, you know, to acquire an interest in our company. Um, not full ownership, but, a, but an interest. And then, um, and we did that and sort of merged our offices out here and in, in which, uh, um, that one building we had became, uh, housed both, uh, the P, uh, uh, Pete Marwick and my, and my firm. And, um, Unfortunately, they had an audit mentality and basically wanted to have all our clients turn become audit clients. And so the, the goals and objectives were in different directions. And, um, and it turned out that they, um, as being accountants, were very good at uh, keeping track of their time. And, um, and they, would, uh, they had a hard time really understanding the world of technology. And so um, they wanted uh, us to do a lot of the work, but show up on their billing sheets. And so we had conflict constantly, um, and um, and and it was not a it was not a good relationship. Um, it, it turned out to be that not a good relationship. And uh, and and uh, I think we got them some audits, but they never got us any business. And um, um, so uh, there was a a young group of new executives at Pete Marwick that came in um, in the late 90s. Um, um, and I'm trying to think of his name now, but uh, uh, his, his first name was John, and, and John came to see me, he was chairman, and he was one of the young Turks that sort of took over from the older partners there. And um, he came in to see me in my office and he said, uh, you know, uh, we just, uh, this isn't working. And I said, yeah, that's what I, want, I wanted to see you about. And he said, um, uh, he said, but, and I want to tell you, he said, you were the most successful of the ones we, we bought into. He said, because the Nolan Norton went out of business. They put them out of business. They just couldn't do anything in where they were before. And they were, they were really good. Um, the, and so none of the sort of things they invested in really turned out well for them. And so um, he made a deal. I bought it back, and uh, but uh, I bought it back with uh, with really bad finances. Um, they had got us into a number of offices. Uh, we were overstaffed uh, by Pete Marwick people because we jointly staffed them, um, who were you know earning more than they were bringing in, um, and our receivables were out you know more than 120 days. Uh, millions of dollars and so uh, I had to clean that up 
and that uh, that that was that was hard. That was uh, you know twenty hour days and uh, and just a, you know a lot of work with a lot of people bringing in some uh, I brought in a CFO who was really sharp and good and cleaned up the finances and got us really um, on a nice cash flow by just cleaning up the receivables um, and uh, got rid of all the people who were um, uh, basically costing more than they were earning and uh, quite a few people actually I think uh, I think I got rid of about 20 executives uh, that were mostly the, the, you know from that side um, and um, but it, it was it was hard and uh, and you, you aged during the process um, but you know what uh, in a way it was uh, it, it was a, a lesson too and um, I was going to ask you what what would well be the, the less lesson? the lesson is I'll that never do there's that no again. white knight out there uh, you know and I used to tell clients that I mean there's nobody who's going to magically uh, my initial thought was that to get involved with one of these professional organizations would would um, would cast light on us as more of a professional consulting firm. So the fact that they wanted to do it and that they would put some people and money into it said that they could have an influence in the consulting world. And, and they, their, their clients were the, a lot of the big companies in the United States. Um, but down at the working level, that didn't, didn't see fruit. And so um, that really is sort of the idea that there's no magic bullet out there. You've got to work. You know, and the way we did it was really working up from the grassroots up, improving our capabilities year after year after year, and taking one step at a time. And so it came to where uh, my wife Diane says that, you know, my answer to everything is you just put one foot in front of the other and keep moving. And, um, and uh, that was the way we got back into business. Uh, this question may be related to the first one that we just talked about, which is uh, kind of a, a dark, a dark moment, and how you surmounted that challenge. So certainly, the Pete Marwick episode was not a, a sunny moment, and you overcame it. Is there is there another one uh, that comes to mind? No, I think that uh, you know the, the 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 consulting business by nature is sort of a project business. So it's not this idea where, um, see, Intel and Apple were clients of ours for maybe near 25 years, 20 to 25 years. That's, that's a long stay for having, uh, you know, somebody of our nature stay with the company that long and over is. that period of growth. And particularly through the 80s and into the 90s, they were, they, you know, there was a, a, a lot of turmoil, management changes and those sorts of things. And, and we lived through all of those days. Um, and um, I eventually resigned both clients simply because both of them started, uh, well, Intel started absorbing a lot of the work we were doing internally. And they, I think they wanted to have control over, uh, we had so much, it took them seven years to actually sort of rid themselves of, of us. And, um, um, but we had deep roots into Intel and all their divisions. Um, both here and in Europe and in Oregon and, and, and other places. We had teams of people working with them and, and they, their people had come to depend on us for, you know, helping them uh, in the communications area. And, uh, um, but it got to a point where as, they, as more and more of what we were doing uh, was absorbed inside, it uh, meant our revenues were going down and I felt um, that we could earn more money by actually working with their competitors uh, or near competitors and that's what I did and and I called Andy Grove and told him and uh, so we you know we walked away no 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 big issue and uh, we continued to do business and we got new clients like you know IBM and uh, and uh, Philips and other big companies throughout the world uh, Sony uh, Mitsubishi, uh, some larger companies, uh, and uh, our consulting team just moved into projects within those companies, and um, and I think it, it it actually got more technical consulting. We had throughout the '90s, we brought in more um, technically competent people. I think uh, some of whom have started their own tech companies 
and are doing very well. Um, um, my fitness pal, I think one of the partners in that is, came from RMI. Um, and um, uh, there's a, a, a telecom company that was, um, it's in San Jose that was started, a very successful company over the last 15 years, was started by one of the people who worked for us. And, um, but they found their ways into uh, lots of more um, managerial and positions. The VP of marketing at Symantec came from our com company. Uh, so, you know, as you get into these larger companies and you get freedom to do projects, you have to know more, you have to have more capability, and the people you're working with demand it. It's not a question of you sort of doing an errand for them or executing on a, something that they had an idea. It's a question of offering ideas and then having those ideas take through to fruition. And, uh, and, um, and that, uh, I think Intel trained us a lot to do that because they had their project. I mean, I talked about the Crush Group, but um, that was the turnaround in the microprocessor business that uh, Intel was losing their leadership. And the Crush Group was pulled together. It was, uh, I think it was a nine, eight or nine executives or, or senior people that Grove uh, assigned to f come up with a strategy for the company. And he put me on in that strategy group. And I subsequently was on other um, task forces at Intel helping solve problems. Um, and um, the demand there is that uh, you deliver on, on what you say you can do. And, and they measure you on that. So you, it's, it's good discipline for sort of a, a, a business that was um, sort of, um, in the early days, people would say, well, you really don't need management. You're just a bunch of artists, right? You just sort of give ideas out there and let people, uh, I was told that. And uh, they didn't think that we should read management books or we needed to do that. And, um, and that was just the opposite of what- Just uh, the opposite. Yeah. There, there was a dark moment for Silicon Valley, certainly in the downturn of the early 2000s, 2001 through maybe even five or six. I mean, it was a long period when things yeah. really bottomed out. Um, what, what is your observation about what, what happened there? Did it, first of all, did it, how were you and your business affected by that? And, and how did Silicon Valley rally from that? That's a that's perhaps a dark moment we could talk about. Yeah, um, yeah. There there was uh, now. I was fairly active in the. Uh, you know, um, I don't think we even talked about it, but in 1986, I became a ha half time partner at Kleiner Perkins, and um, and there's always question of whether or not I was distracted. You know, with that, though, I was trying to do both, and um, it just added another more lines to my calendar. Um, and uh, so for me, um, I never invested in a dot com. I was, um, you know, trying to do more platform companies. I liked more basic technology companies. I never invested in a marketing company uh, as, as such. Uh, it was always something that had more platform to it or more substance and a couple, you know, chip companies uh, I was involved in, as I said, microchip or linear. Um, um, and, and so, I, you know, I was fine, um, but the business suffered, um, probably catastrophically, um, because, um, major clients cut back on all consulting. Companies like IBM went to Z, they were said, I need it. No more, you know, all external consulting is to stop. And, um, so, uh, that recession was, uh, hurt us a lot. And, um, and so the business was, uh, you know, uh, shrunk down um, and it was sort of starting all over again. Um, it was almost like after the Pete Marwick adventure, you basically we had a reboot, reboot and restart everything. And um, I really didn't want to do that. Um, and so um, I uh, started essentially created a, an organization where all of the existing partners at that time, I simply distributed shares of the company to them and said, it's yours. I, I didn't, I owned, I was a minority stockholder. Um, and so the decisions were up to them. 
and eventually what they decided to do was sort of create their own paths. Um, they off went off and started doing into, taking their clients and doing their own thing. And for me, that was, that was a perfect way to do it. Um, it was a perfect way to, to wind it up, to hand it to your Yeah, the, the other employees. ways I could have done it and I had opportunities to do it was to sell the company. And, um, and I had talked to actually McKinsey senior partners, um, 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 person Marsteller, had, I had long conversations with their, their people, including Marsteller. Um, um, so many companies that wanted to acquire us. And, um, and, um, but the, the way you buy a service company is it's an earn out. So they may give you some cash at the front end and then you earn it out over the next how many or five years or so. So you make profits and then you, out of those profits, you buy yourself back. You, you, you essentially pay for the company. And, uh, uh, and I used to say, I'm not going to buy myself. You know, I'm not going to do that. So if you want to buy it, you pay cash and we pay off the stockholders and employees own stock and, and that's it. But uh, people would then essentially walk away. Now, when I sold the advertising in 81, Shia did that. I mean, I said, I'll, you know, we'll just go with a straight cash deal, uh, no guarantees. Uh, I'm not going to come back and save a client and there's no earn out. And, um, and, and that worked. Um, he did, he, he did very well by it. I think maybe even still has Apple today. Um, and, um, and, and Jay was always a, a close friend and a good mentor to me. And, um, so we were able to work that out. I think other places were just looking for a, a way to get into Silicon Valley. And, uh, I had a lot of consulting firms want to get in here in a lot of different ways. So, but it was always an earn out kind of deal. And, uh, I wasn't willing to do that. I mean, I had, I, I could easily do things on my own um, and create, you know, I had venture investments and continued to invest in startups. So um, um, for me, it, it was the perfect answer. And, uh, um, you know, I think, I think, in fact, everybody that I know of that was the partner at the time are doing quite well today. So a good answer for the people yeah. who took their portions of the company yeah. and did their own things. Yeah. What, uh, what one word, this is the, this is the one word campaign. One word again. Uh, as you know, uh, what one word of advice would you have for an aspiring entrepreneur and, and what's a story from your life or career that illustrates why it's important? Yeah. So I was asked by, uh, I was at an event in, uh, it, um, on, um, it was a Japanese audience, and it was a Japanese uh, um, interrogator. And he asked me, you know, a similar question: What, what one word would you advice would you give to marketing people? And uh, and would you know have you used? And I put, I told him curiosity. And um, that was you know, 20 years ago, I think. And I still feel that, that my life has been driven by curiosity. Um, I, I have a, you know, thousands of books library. It's all, it's very eclectic. Um, I'm, I'm reading one of the original books by Galileo right now, the original, you know, uh, translated edition of um, the um, dialogues of two different theories of the of planets. Uh, and um, it, it's fascinating to read. I mean, and so I, if I see, find something that I'm interested, I read, you know, algorithm or things like that, even though I'm, that's not in my nature to read those kind of books. I like history books. Um, but I, I, and I, and I, so I collect lots of those diverse kinds of things that stimulate your curiosity and give you ideas. Um, and so, uh, I think if you're going into business today or if you're interested in business, you have to be curious about the world around you. Um, where is this technology taking it? What other technologies have impact on me that I'm not paying attention to? Um, you know, what companies are, are on the horizon that, that could have influence on what I'm doing? Uh, Peter Drucker said that the, the 21st century is going to be a century in which 
there are going to be more outside influences affecting your company than inside influences. And so reorganization doesn't change you as much as the reorganization of the society and markets that you're, you're, that you're going into. And so, um, uh, you know, what um, I think my, my, my book on IBM was right. It wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't the big companies that affected IBM, it was all these little companies. And so what killed digital equipment? It, it wasn't another big computer company. It was all these, it was the, the shrinkage of the microcomputer on a chip. It was the shrinkage of small personal computers getting more and more capable. And uh, it was the internet. It was all of the other technologies that came along that created uh, competitive forces that, that were overwhelming to them. And so that's gonna happen time and time again. It's, uh, we're in a new world, it's, that's, not, that's not the real world. That's just a sample of what the new world is going to be on, uh, uh, in megatrends. Um, so, um, and again, I'm repeating myself, but I like to show that single transistor that when I started, you know, 55 years ago in the business, I was marketing transistors. One little die that if I dropped it on the floor, you'd have a hard time finding it. Um, and this has 5 billion transistors in it. So that career from one to five billion in a small space is, is going to probably happen in the next 20 years or less. Um, and people in going into the marketplace today are, are going to be deluged with the need to, to constantly be on the education path, learn things. And you learn not in a linear way, but in a, um, in sort of a, um, in an eclectic fashion, because you never know what's going to influence you. It, it, it isn't necessarily what's in front of you. It could come from behind. It could come from the sides. Um, it can come from all angles. But you've got to have this curiosity about the world that keeps you looking and searching and, and discovering. Curiosity. Curiosity. That's your word. Yeah. Good. Uh, and then as you look back at, at particular pieces of work um, that, that you did, you've done Regis and your ads and notebooks, uh, they did want me to ask which, what work are you most proud of? Uh, they, this question specifically calls out advertising, but it, it may or may not be an ad or, or something else. I think it's more, what are you most proud of? Yeah, I think that the, the you know, um, I, I hardly remember the advertising anymore because, you know, I was in it for such a relatively short period of time. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, from, uh, well, 10 years, basically, and then sold that in 81. Um, the, the, the programs were really, I think, the IDA of Ireland, I think, was a significant program. I think uh, being a member of the task forces at Intel, the crush trans, uh, really, that transformed Intel. And to be there, just even if I were a fly on the wall, it was worth sitting in those meetings and being part of, you know, making presentations weekly to the executive staff at Intel um, and having, you know, my share of responsibility to get things done. Um, I think the, um, the whole sort of evolution of Apple, um, the, um, the story, the creation of the story, the, um, the follow through on uh, how, Marketing is everything at Apple, and it really is. Uh, it's every aspect of Apple. It's everybody there. Um, I think being a, not necessarily driving all of that, but being part of it. Um, and um, I think that and telling the story so that it became worldwide uh, was certainly an accomplishment. I think the, the working with Genentech was certainly significant in that here was the, the first instance in which um, a protein, insulin, could be created in a laboratory, um, uh, you know, recomb recombining DNA and putting it in a, um, in a process that's sort of like yeast in, in bread or beer where it grows and then you kill off the bacteria that, that, that creates the factories and you create, you know, insulin for... Um, that's, it's more compatible with the, the human body and being a diabetic that had a huge influence on me. Um, 
So um, I think even, you know, working at Kleiner Perkins uh, with Tom Perkins, uh, Gene Kleiner, both of those people uh, I got to know well. Um, um, I did some work for both Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett per personally. They had investments and friends and little companies and they asked me to look after them. Um, uh, you know, there, there isn't probably a, a company, a major company in the world that I didn't get to do something with or get to know the CEOs. And, um, um, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was an exciting life. And, um, you know, I met a lot of the people who were presidents and uh, prime ministers and people of that nature in other countries and so forth. Um, it, was, um, it was always uh, another layer of the onion to unfold and see something new. And so it's, uh, I, I describe people that it's, uh, you can get a job in a cubicle and do the same thing year after year after year, but every day I had, I was going to something new. I was seeing something different. I was seeing, uh, you know, the rise of software, um, Intel. Um, Ed Gelbach, who was the VP of marketing when, uh, in the early days of Intel, used to, he, he wanted us to do an ad for Intel that said, um, uh, are we ready for software? Because there was a time when, you know, these were, these were all hardware. These were all hard uh, technologies. And so the software came in only with the microprocessor. It was the first time that you had an operating system on a microprocessor. And that was created by Gary Kildall, who was a client, and who used to fly from me down to, uh, to um, uh, Monterey, where he had his company. And he would come up here to my office, and I would fly down there with him. Um, uh, you know, uh, on the SIA, um, uh, Noyce and, uh, um, and um, what's his name, uh, Gil Emilio uh, and I were the marketing committee, and so Noyce liked to fly his jet, so I would, he, we would fly down to Los Angeles to have a meeting, because he liked to fly. Um, and a lot of the executives flew planes, and they're private planes, and so I would often go with them. Uh, even just sometimes there was one executive that we went out to lunch one day and he said, you mind if I stop at the airport? So when we stopped at the airport, he says, I just want to take off for a little spin. I haven't done it in a while. So I went up and we flew around San Jose Airport and then landed and went back to work. And so, I mean, you know, getting to know people at that level and in that sort of intimate way and to get to know them personally um, and, and it, uh, to me was, uh, um, was something I don't think too many people that are in my profession get to do today. It's, it's much more arm's length, much more abstract, um, and much more of a, a, a contractor. And uh, we never felt being as if we were contractors. This is great. Thank you so much, Regis. Okay. I think that's a perfect way to wrap up this series. Good. Thank you. Good.